As 2017 closes for My Life in Gaming, we find ourselves looking back on how we did. And of course, the games we played throughout the year. We thought it was about high time we made a tradition of sharing our yearly game reflections. Specifically, these are games that we played through from beginning to end for the first time this past year, marking them as beaten on our backloggery pages. Some of these games were released in 2017, while many others are much older. So let's get to it. This is a selection of games that we beat in 2017 that left the biggest impression. What seems to be a reoccurring theme these past few years, I didn't get a chance to play a lot of games outside of stuff for the show. This has everything to do with the fact that I'm a parent with two kids, and because of that, anything that has to do with games takes a lot longer than it used to. A good outlet for me to sit down and play through some games not intended for an episode has been our regularly scheduled Sunday night live streams. In addition to some old favorites, I finished several games, new and old, that would be among my favorites this year. 2017 was definitely the year of the limited physical copy. Yeah, the practice has been on the rise since B-Blank and Limited Run Games popularized it, but this year saw tons of additional boutique publishers step in. Out of all these boutique publishers, I felt that the online import retailer, PlayAsia, had some of the nicer releases on offer. Now this, this is what I'm talking about. Curse Casilla is a side-scrolling arcade action game that plays homage to Capcom's Ghouls and Ghosts series in the purest form. This game in particular falls more in line with Ghouls and Ghosts more than any of the other sequels, which is good because that's the best one anyways. Man, I just adore the graphical style of this game. The gorgeous pixel art really emulates the feel of a classic arcade game, and hey, it even plays in a 4x3 aspect ratio. Perhaps the most interesting thing about Curse Castilla is that it was almost entirely developed by one person, Spanish developer Loco Molito. He's made a number of different games that play homage to various arcade games, and I'm definitely a fan now. I'm on board for any other console releases he does in the future. The second game I purchased from PlayAsia is Ghost Blade HD, a fantastic vertically scrolling bullet hell shooter. It was developed by Hughcast Games, an independent developer who got their start making Dreamcast games, if the Fantasy Star Online inspired name didn't quite give it away. Now, I love me some shooters, despite never being able to put in quite the amount of time needed to get really good at them. While this might not quite reach cave levels, it's super fun to play and just flat out well made. Three characters to choose from, several difficulties, and a caravan style score attack give you plenty of bang for your buck. For me, a big part of the appeal of a shooter is the rock and soundtrack, and Ghostblade delivers a top notch effort. This version includes an additional remix OST by Sir Flash of Studio Mudprints, who produces the absolutely amazing YouTube series Bullet Heaven. If you're a shooter fan, check it out. Okay, so both of these releases came in limited editions that includes a number of goodies, but nothing too huge, which is how I like my special editions anyways. Although these are a little bit pricey right now, hopefully they'll be getting some non-LE editions in 2018 for anyone to be able to buy. Even though it was released in late December of 2016, I finally got to spend some time with Wild Guns Reloaded. This port slash remaster of the original Super NES game was something of a surprise announcement. I guess this was some sort of a fun side project for the same team that made the original game. Here they pretty much took the SNES graphics, scaled them to HD, opened up the playing field to widescreen, and added a couple of new playable characters and levels. Oh yeah, it's also four players. Local only though. Wild Guns is an arcade style third person shooter almost reminiscent of an on rails shooter but you typically don't move through a level in the same way. I guess the term gallery shooter would be more apt. Think like Cabal on the NES or Dynamite Duke on the Genesis. 
On a side note, I'd say the Wild Guns Reloaded has one of the best CRT style filter implementations I've ever seen, adding in scan lines and a touch of convergence the higher you go. Although for a long time I wished that I had the SNES cart, but this new version is a total and complete replacement that makes me okay with never owning that version. Wild Guns Reloaded was really special for me too, and it was a ton of fun to co-op. Well, I wouldn't say no to the SNES cart for a crazy low price or something. I agree with everything Corey said about this definitive PS4 version, and Doris is just flat out fun to play as. Another retro remake that I played in 2017 was the incredible Wonder Boy The Dragon's Trap. It's no secret that we're pretty big fans of the Monster World branch of the Wonder Boy series, and I've gotta say, playing through this version gave me an even greater appreciation for this particular entry. The love that developer Lizard Cube has for the game oozes out of every frame of animation and piece of music, and I just can't help but love it as much as they do. This year, I played through the three mainline entries in the Panzer Dragoon series, the first two on Saturn and Orta on the Xbox. I would say that the original made the strongest impression on me in large part due to its limited continue system, allowing me to get more acquainted with the game overall. Spy feels more driven by atmosphere than action, which is cool in its own way, but it was kind of over before I knew it. As for Orta, wow, what an impressive game, but I don't think I played it quite right and my dragon was not properly leveled up, leading to five hours of attempts against the final boss during our marathon for Extra Life in November. For better or worse, I don't think I'll ever forget that. Another Sega series that I played through this past year was the loose trilogy of Mickey and Donald games for the Genesis. I half-heartedly bought Castle of Illusion at a retro shop in Albuquerque, New Mexico while passing through on summer vacation, just because it's an iconic Genesis game, but I never really thought it looked all that good. But boy was I wrong. It's hard to convey exactly why, but it absolutely lives up to its reputation. It's just simple, but very well-crafted platforming. Quackshot, or I Love Donald Duck as it's called in Japan, was also quite good, but a bit less straightforward to progress through. World of Evolution also has some interesting stuff going for it, but feels less solidly grounded overall. Twenty seventeen marked the first year that I ever beat games on a few consoles that I'm new to. Even though I got my Sega CD in twenty sixteen, I hadn't finished a game for it until Road Avenger this past year. And boy, what a literal wild ride! If you're an FMV fan who hasn't played it, like I somehow hadn't, you're gonna love it. While I have played some Turbo Graphics games on Virtual Console, the Japanese version of Bonk's Adventure, known as PC Genjin, became the first game that I played through from start to finish on actual PC Engine hardware. And I decided that with the launch of the Xbox One X, I would get into the Xbox One family of consoles, with the first game I finished on the platform being the gorgeous Ori in the Blind Forest a masterpiece of Metroid-like design that might be better than a lot of actual Metroid games. Can't wait for Ori and the Will of the Wisps. Of course, I also beat my first games on Nintendo Switch this year, but we'll come back around to that a bit later. 
I'm always on the lookout for more fun, lower profile NES and Famicom games, and this year I especially enjoyed Gargoyle's Quest 2 and Jackie Chan's Action Kung Fu. Gargoyle's Quest 2 is the last game I needed to finish in the trilogy that began with the Game Boy original and ended with Demon's Crest, and it might just be my favorite, such a wonderful Capcom series. As for Jackie Chan, now that is just one heck of a fun looking and fun to play NES game, but don't take my word for it. Check out Game Dave's review in the unbelievably produced season finale of his storyline series that he finished in July, but don't forget to start from the beginning. Assorted other retro games that I finished for the first time in 2017, Spyro the Dragon is a surprisingly well-aged first entry in an iconic PlayStation series that I've always been curious about but ignored for a long time. But it just plays wonderfully with a DualShock controller, and while the level design may not be particularly notable, I'm really looking forward to playing the rest of Insomniac's PS1 Spyro games. Avenging Spirit is a game whose existence I didn't even know about until early in the year, and it looks so good that I just couldn't get it out of my mind until I ran across a copy at Too Many Games. This is a Game Boy adaptation of an arcade game, and the quality and charm of the character sprites is some serious top-tier Game Boy stuff. You play as a spirit who can only survive outside a possessed enemy body for a short time. I mean, how can you say no to a game where you can play as a fire-breathing kangaroo? Definitely a kangaroo. Absolutely one of my top favorites for the year. Dynamite Cop for the Dreamcast was a game I had my eye out for at conventions all year, and I finally found it at a local shop. Now this is just a stupid and fun game, mostly because it's stupid and it knows it's stupid. I know Corey had a great time with this one in December. Seriously, Dynamite Cop. It was just so over the top and stupid that I could not help but love it. I mean, can you name another game where a hostage situation takes a quick detour to brawl with the Kraken deep within the holds of a cruise ship? The Kraken! Bunk's Revenge is the game I've been meaning to get around to since I beat the original on the Wii Virtual Console so many years ago. I liked the first game, but there's just something about the momentum-based controls that didn't gel with what I was expecting. Revenge is generally considered to be the best Bonk game, and if any game in the series was going to click with me, it'd probably be this one. Once I finally understood that the key is not to rush and take your time on a level, things fell in place for me, and in the end, I loved it. My interest in future entries in the series is completely revived, which feels great because I'm a huge fan of Bonk's character design. Being a Sega kid growing up, my love for Shinobi is a given. I was always on top of the series, but surprisingly, I never got around to playing the Saturn entry, Shinobi Legions, before this year. Legions combines two things that I love, Super Shinobi style gameplay and 90s digitized characters and FMV. I mean, really, a Shinobi game with Mortal Kombat style graphics? Kind of an unexpected approach to the series, and in 1996, probably a huge mistake. But in 2017, amazing. I was a little bummed that the story here doesn't connect to all the previous games in the series at all. So no Joe Musashi or Neo Zed or whatever. But when you have live action cutscenes as good as this, I can deal with it. I'd say it's probably important to distance your expectations from previous games in the series because it's nowhere near as fast paced and intense as those. 
Apparently Sega of America had no faith in this game, leaving Vic Tokai to publish it in the US. Maybe they thought that the style just wouldn't resonate with audiences at the time. And heck, I guess that they were right, because Shinobi disappeared to the PlayStation 2. But checking this out now, I think that this was a lot better than it was probably ever given credit for. Wandering around this deserted island is making me want to go back home. These days, there's very few games that I tell myself that it's a priority to start them day one. It's even fewer and far between when I say this about a game that I know is going to be kind of long. When Ease 8, Lacrimosa of Donna, was released in September, it was time to clear my schedule. Now, I knew it was going to be a good game, but I didn't think it'd ever be able to top the Oath and Felgana to become my favorite entry in the series. It's probably crazy for me to say it, but to me, this is basically Ease in its ultimate form. Serious protagonist and ultimate badass, Adol Kristen finds himself once again stranded on a desert island after a weird creature takes down the boat he was on. Together with the other castaways, they build a small village and work together to explore the island. What they find there is a surprise to everybody. It's all about the story and gameplay, which is crazy good and extremely fun to play. 8's soundtrack, as expected from Sound Team JDK, is a home run. Now, Ease 8 was published this time around by NIS instead of XSEED, who published the last few games. A lot has been made of 8's less than stellar translation. I guess I've just dealt with some not so great translations in my life that I barely even thought about it or noticed. It absolutely did not hinder my enjoyment of the game at all. Regardless, NIS is going to be releasing a patch to touch up a lot of the stuff that people had issues with. I don't know, to me, that sounds like a great excuse to replay the game. <laughs> Bring it on! I'm better at these types of things! Come on, ancient species! I, Dogie, will take you all on! I could not believe how quickly Cory devoured Ez8, and he got me really hyped up for it, so I can't wait to play it myself. But a few PS4 games that I played this year, of course Resident Evil 7 was released to wide praise for going back to its roots and reinventing the franchise at the same time. But what impresses me so much is how well it balances the tropes that make Resident Evil Resident Evil while still being more restrained. It's terrifying while still being fun and even if I have actually mostly enjoyed Resident Evil's derailment into action territory, it's a relief to see Capcom reassess the series and make it a bit more grounded, but not too grounded. Persona 5 was my reward for finishing the episode on RGB and component switchers. I just binged it, playing the game from beginning to end in about 115 hours and two and a half weeks. That might sound kind of crazy, but I don't know, it felt pretty great. I'll reveal your true form. I played Life is Strange with friends on a series of streams over the course of a couple of months. After what was, in my opinion, a slower first episode, I got really invested in the story and mystery of Max, Chloe, and Arcadia Bay. The story has a lot of intense moments and truly tough choices, and developer Don't Nod is definitely on my radar if they can continue to make this sort of storytelling their forte. Okay, so this isn't exactly a totally new game to me, but I do want to cheat a bit and give a mention to the HD Zodiac Age version of Final Fantasy XII. Spending a couple of weeks running through an old favorite didn't do any favors for my backlog, but it was some much needed gaming comfort food and really reinforced that it's my favorite Final Fantasy game outside the SNES PS1 Golden Age. A bit of a lesser known one, but I grabbed Limited Run's physical release of The Swapper, which turned out to be one of my favorite games they published in 2017. 
I've got a huge soft spot for platforming puzzlers, and The Swapper manages to be just as engaging in this regard as it is with its story that keeps you second guessing if you are still you. 2017 in games will probably mostly be remembered as the year that brought us the Nintendo Switch, and it didn't take long before it was clear that Nintendo could still find success in the hardware business. Super Mario Odyssey was the biggest exclusive for the system, and it was wonderful to get an open-ended 3D Mario to explore for the first time since 2002. This is a game that has no problem with doing silly, ridiculous, and completely out of place things in the name of fun, and it's a journey I'll never forget. And lastly, of course, there's The Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild. Nothing in this episode is really meant to be part of a ranked list or anything, but I think it's safe to say that if we wanted to declare one game of the year for both of us, this would be it. When I realized that our trip to Los Angeles to shoot James Riley's interview for our Night Trap documentary would start only a couple days after the Switch launch, I was a bit disappointed that I wouldn't have more time to get fully engrossed in Breath of the Wild on my TV at home in the way that I'd envisioned but sometimes the best experiences come about in a way that you'd never expect. And for us, playing Breath of the Wild in Switch handheld mode on our LA trip is something we'll never forget. Going into Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild, I knew two things, what it looked like, and it was an open world take on the series that was supposed to harken back to the first game. In the last couple of years, I've kind of got myself into a bit of a routine where I know if I'm going to buy a game, I absolutely stop paying attention to it after I see the first trailer. This helps remove me from the hype and just kind of allows me to enjoy a game for what it is, without any real extra baggage. Due to Breath of the Wild's non-linear game structure, my limited knowledge of the game, and along with an extended trip, created the perfect storm of a game experience that neither of us expected. In many ways, it went back to a feeling of children sharing game discoveries on the playground at school. We went back and forth, sharing with each other stuff that we discovered in the world. And because of the game's lesser story focus, we could do this without fear of spoiling anything for each other. There was this whole world full of hundreds, if not thousands of things to discover, and pretty much all of it was a complete surprise to both of us. It's a deeply challenging game, but one that rewards patience. You could die at any moment, but the wonder that lies just beyond the hardship you might be facing is enough to get you to try again and again. Hyrule's sense of scale is something not seen in many games. You truly feel like you can go anywhere, and that there's no limits. And you know what? There basically isn't. Of course I'm not saying that it's a perfect game. Breakable weapons were fairly annoying, and the music lacked that grandeur that I was really hoping for going in. But in pretty much all aspects, Breath of the Wild comes together under a vision with pinpoint accuracy. It's hard to say that the next time a game will have this sort of impact on the world of gaming. The last one had to be Mario 64, and before that, Super Mario Brothers. Okay, okay, listen. I like the Zelda series. I don't love this series. In fact, I say that the only game in the series that I truly love is Link to the Past. But I think it's safe to say that Breath of the Wild stands tall alongside that game and far and away ranks as my favorite game of the year. It wasn't just the game, but it was the situation and circumstances I found myself in that made it transcend beyond what the game is at its core. It was an experience, and I absolutely will never forget it. Twenty seventeen was an equal parts of big year and a bit of an off year for my life in gaming. Early on we knew we were probably going to be able to produce a documentary about Night Trap, which we were so excited about that it became kind of hard to focus on anything else. We really want documentaries to become a major pillar of the channel, and this was our coolest opportunity yet. And of course, there were a number of big RGB episodes, including the 200 level videos on Saturn and PS2. But at the same time, we also had a lot of long gaps between releases. Month-long gaps, which had never happened before in all of the channel's four years. We kept having these 
impromptu apology sessions during our Sunday night live streams about the wait for episodes. We feel that we got super hung up on bigger episodes in 2017. And it was sort of a wake up call for us to realize that we need to refocus how we work in 2018. We still plan to do big episodes when the topic calls for it, but we also want to try out a lot of smaller topics that we think are just as interesting and we can release more quickly. We've already got some documentary type stuff falling into place for 2018. And don't worry, there's plenty of RGB episodes coming too. To all the new fans that just joined us this year, and those of you who have been around since the beginning, thanks for being along for the ride. Even though we've been at it for four years now, trust us when we say we're just getting started. As the sun sets on 2018, it's time for us to once again reflect on what we played throughout the year. In 2018, we played everything from NES, PC Engine, and Sega Genesis on up to Switch, Xbox One, and PlayStation VR. So as always for us, this is not your typical Game of the Year list. Mostly, we'll be focusing on our favorite games that we actually finished in 2018, but there are also a few others that we just had to talk about. So let's dig in. These are the games that we enjoyed in 2018. I think it's safe to say that the time really got away from me this year. The number of games I was able to put a significant amount of time into was way down this year. That said, I did play a lot of incredible games, some brand new, and others where it was about time that I finally got around to them. Although I rarely get into first person shooters these days, I'd heard a lot of praise for one of last year's biggest flops, Titanfall 2. I don't have a lot of interest in online competitive deathmatch, so hearing that the single player was exceptionally great convinced me to grab it for around $10. Wow, what an experience. This is perhaps the smoothest first person shooter I've ever played. From wall running to double jumping, you feel like you can do just about anything. The titans themselves feel like lumbering beasts, but are nonetheless agile. This certainly makes all other FPSs feel sluggish in comparison. A relatively breezy six hour campaign is all killer with no filler. From time travel to bounding from spaceship to spaceship, you're doing something different in every single level. Nice jump! Titanfall 2 was super fun to play and exactly the kind of single player experience I look for these days. Mega Man 11 was a must play from the second it was announced and it certainly didn't let me down. Ready. At first, I was a little bit nervous about the addition of the gear system, which allows you to slow down time or power up your attacks because they seem to deviate from the tried and true Mega Man formula. Thankfully, these injected some much needed spice into the mix after the back to basics of nine and 10 and felt right at home. There were also some other liberties taken to help bring the original series into the modern era, like longer levels, quality of life improvements, and multi-tiered boss battles. Mega Man 11 serves as a base that will hopefully be expanded upon with the eventual Mega Man 12, leading to a Mega Man 1 to Mega Man 2 style evolution of excellence. Here's to another 30 years of Mega Man games. Without a doubt, the most egregious example of it's about time that I played that was Sonic Mania. When it released in August of 2017, I decided to hold off on buying it for a little bit because I simply didn't have time to play it. While the game drew rave reviews from everyone who tried it, once the initial hype passed and I still hadn't bought it, well, I decided to just play it cool and see if a physical release was announced. Nearly a year later, that physical release arrived in the form of Sonic Mania Plus 
which included new DLC on the cart along with tweaks and refinements to the original game. In anyone else's hands, this probably would have been yet another ride on the Sonic Cycle merry-go-round. But the amount of passion poured into this game is truly inspiring. Although this is a love letter to the original Sonic games, it was the little touches that celebrate Sega's overall history that really made me smile. Even the package's reverse Sega Genesis style cover was designed with care to accuracy. Although I do feel it would have been best if it was a Sega Saturn cover. The remix music tracks are simply fantastic, but the new tracks stand shoulder to shoulder with them, picking up right where Sonic and Knuckles left off. And I really need to mention the perfect looking CRT filter, which is likely the best interpretation I've ever seen in the game, taking the crown from last year's Wild Guns Reloaded. Of course, it's not perfect. I felt that the levels got a little bit too long toward the end, so much so that I even ran out of time in a few instances, which is something that never killed me in a previous Sonic game. And I still really, really dislike Blue Sphere. <laughs> After how amazing and fresh Sonic Mania felt after two decades of buildup, I'm not sure if a perfect storm can ever come together like this again. Regardless, Sega should just let these guys revive absolutely any dormant franchise in their library, because they pulled off a miracle here. This is the best Sonic game ever made, and deserves all the praise it received. While Sonic Mania relished in the past, it was a little game by the name of Astrobot Rescue Mission that took the platformer boldly into the future with the use of the PlayStation VR. As someone who had little to no interest in VR previously, this is as much of a surprise to me as it probably is to you. I was told that this game was VR's Mario 64 moment, and once you try it, this becomes a very apt description. It's very hard for me to describe and show you what it's like. You simply need to play it and experience it for yourself. Corey's excitement over Astrobot was a big part of what made me feel like it was finally time to buy into PlayStation VR. And wow, it really does feel like a very new way to experience a game world. Whereas Super Mario 64 introduced many of us to what 3D platforming could be within the confines of a two-dimensional viewing surface, Astrobot immediately feels like something beyond the 3D that we already know. As you view the world in 360 degrees around you, you move your body and shift your head to discover secrets and reveal side paths in a way that simply could not be intuitively done with a conventional camera system. Astrobot revels in hiding things in places that just make you smile because these things simply couldn't be done outside of VR. People typically think of VR as being for first person experiences, but Astrobot has me wondering whether third person VR might actually be better. What is that? What? <laughs> oh, ge oh, geez. <laughs> One of my personal top gaming experiences for 2018, well, you can't exactly call it a game unto itself, but in a lot of ways it felt like one. Following the flubbed release of Final Fantasy XIV in 2010 and its shockingly successful rebirth in 2013, the first proper expansion arrived in 2015. I had heard it was good, but having finally played it, Final Fantasy XIV Heavensward blew me away. Of course, there are some barriers of entry. Aside from being part of an MMO, actually playing Heavensward requires the completion of a Realm Reborn's main quest, plus an interim storyline that leads up to the events of the expansion. So this summer, I thought I'd finally just finish up those last missions leading up to Heavensward, but as soon as the events unfolded, whew, wow. Corey and I often talk about Final Fantasy moments. This is among the best. Tis hardly the first time, and I'll be damned if it will be the last. Crazy stuff happens, every character has an awesome moment, and I could just not leave it at that. Up to this point, the story of Final Fantasy XIV had been fine, nothing too special, but it was enjoyable enough. This is one heck of a turning point, and it hardly lets up from there. 
Heaven's Word opens up the way to the city of Ishgard, which was visible in the distance all those years ago in the game's 1.0 version. And at last, eight years later, my character enters, but under circumstances that I very much did not expect. The expansion also adds the lands north of Ishgard along with flying mounts such as the classic Black Chocobo. In terms of combat, with the level cap going from 50 to 60, I was very impressed with the progression, with my character's summoner job receiving some fun abilities along the way that improved the flow of combat without my hotbar getting too complicated. But I really mean it when I say that Heavensward is the best Final Fantasy story I've experienced since the late 90s. While a few things happened along the way that I think could have been handled differently, the story pacing gave me a feeling that not many modern RPGs provide. I just binged it. I had to see what was going to happen next at every turn. He has fixed his attention on Ishgard itself, though he knows full well the eye does not reside there. Aside from a few dungeons and boss fights along the way, a majority of the story is best tackled solo, traveling along with an engaging cast of NPCs that feels very much like a party that could have formed an SNES or PS1 RPG. It makes me sad to think that most Final Fantasy fans will never experience Heaven's Word just because it's part of an MMO. But if you're not completely opposed to trying a relatively fast-moving MMO and miss that old-school Final Fantasy story feel, I think it's worth investing in. was also a bit of a Dragon Quest year for me. Obviously, there's Dragon Quest XI, the long-awaited single-player console successor to Dragon Quest VIII, which was the game that got me so heavily into the series in the first place. I'm pretty far into XI, but I just didn't have enough time this past fall to finish it just yet. It is very good, though, and I've recently hit quite a turning point, so this is a top priority for finishing as soon as possible. I also got a few hours into the first Dragon Quest Heroes, which I hope to chip away at over the early months of 2019. Seems very fun so far. The one Dragon Quest game I did finish in 2018, though, is Dragon Quest Builders. I decided to wait on the Nintendo Switch version, which actually plays very nicely and was handy for playing away from home. In fact, I was actually viewing the game's ending minutes before landing at Narita Airport on my first ever trip to Japan, which feels very appropriate. I've never been too huge of a Minecraft guy, but Dragon Quest Builders really gives me the mission structure that I need to sink my teeth into a game like this. To beat the game, you complete the quest for four towns that you build one at a time in their own chapters, each with their own simple Dragon Quest type story that unfolds as you save the people from the ills that plague them in this dark version of Alfgard that the Dragon Lord now rules. The Minecraft-esque world aesthetic meshes surprisingly seamlessly with Dragon Quest's higher polygon characters and monsters. This is certainly no throwaway spin-off, and it does an excellent job of capturing the sense of adventure that the classic RPGs are known for. 2018 was a year in which I really got back into falling block puzzlers. Poyo Poyo Tetris is a clever concept, and the different modes that mix the two games together certainly makes for a lot of fun. It had been so long since I'd played through the single player adventure or story mode in a game like this, and it was kind of silly and stupid, but I honestly just had a great time doing that. Before Puyo Puyo Tetris, the only Puyo Puyo variant I owned was Kirby's Avalanche, which has always been a favorite of mine. But boy, go to Japan, and you're just about tripping over all the Puyos, and they're mostly all like five bucks or less. My curiosity got the better of me and I grabbed several different versions. In particular, I did finish the single player story in Puyo Puyo Sun on PS1, but I sure wish I knew Japanese so I could play this cool looking RPG mode in Puyo Puyo Box. But it was Tetris Effect on PlayStation 4 that completely renewed my respect for the most iconic Falling Blocks puzzler of all time. As a game from Tetsuya Mizuguchi of Luminous and Res fame, I wasn't sure if the audio-visual aspect would draw me in. But Tetris Effect lets me feel connected to the music in a way that other music games just can't do for me. The game blends graphics, music, and even perfectly tuned DualShock Force feedback to create an experience that literally feels intoxicating. Your eyes are laser focused on the playfield, while everything else that occurs around you, whether in VR mode or simply on a large television, sings and dances in your peripheral vision. 
Tetris Effect is perfectly designed around the idea of a game that stays in your head hours after you stop playing, and it is indeed hard to stop. The coolest game that Corey and I were able to co-op together this year was A Way Out. This game is the result of an indie studio being given the opportunity to make a polished 3D game with heavy support and funding from Electronic Arts. You guys seem familiar. Have I seen you before? Nah, I don't think so. Hmm. Okay. Whatever. The catch, as you may know, is that this is a co-op only experience, no single player mode at all. I really wasn't too sure what to expect at first. Early on, the story and puzzles seemed pretty standard fare, and overall the game felt pretty restrictive. But as it continues on, it becomes clear that a way out strength is the sheer variety it throws your way. You just never quite know what kind of situation you'll be in next and there were lots of gameplay scenarios in the second half of the game that I was totally not expecting. And these two characters, who I didn't know if I would care about, turned out to have far more interesting stories than I had initially realized. All right, here we go. Here they come. Talk about a surprise. I went into a way out with very little knowledge of what to expect. Up to release, there was a very clear focus on the prison break sequence. That would lead you to believe that almost the entire game is based around that. But in fact, this is only a tiny portion of the overall narrative. A Way Out does include an option for online co-op, but I highly recommend playing this couch co-op style. <laughs> My thumb is like... <laughs> <laughs> With so many games being added to my backlog, I still think it's important to revisit games that I've already beaten from time to time. With the prevalence of remasters this generation, it's easier than ever to mix the new and the old while enjoying some good old fashioned gaming comfort food. I had no idea that Katamari Damacy Reroll, an HD remaster of the original PS2 game for the Nintendo Switch, was so close to release. But the first game was my favorite in the series, and combined with a GameStop exclusive physical edition, I bought it sooner rather than later. I hadn't revisited the game in more than 10 years, and man, this is just as fun as the first time I played it. There's no significant changes or modifications to the overall game, but that's fine. I love the simplicity here, and I felt that at least the second game got bogged down in gimmicky level objectives. Of course, the HD coat of paint is nice, but it's not particularly revelatory due to the graphics being fairly basic in the first place. I didn't notice any frame rate dips as your Katamari grew larger, but I'd hope that the Switch would be able to handle this. <laughs> My six-year-old daughter got a real kick out of it, too. It's such a weird game. She wasn't quite sure what to make of it. Ah! Alligator! Oh. It's a funny game, too. More so than I remembered it being. But for some reason, this version removed all the English VO, and I'm not quite sure why. But still, if you've never played a Katamari game, this is the perfect place to start. And if you're like me, you might just get your fill of the entire series in this one game. Although I'm not too good at it these days, I do love me some Street Fighter, especially Championship Edition. When Capcom announced that the Street Fighter Anniversary Collection was on the way, which included all the arcade revisions of Street Fighter 1 through Third Strike for a total of 12 games, it was an absolute must-buy for me. Round one, fight. Outside of an actual arcade PCB, this would be the be-all, end-all compilation for fans of the series. This collection was developed by Digital Eclipse, who has seen a bit of a rebirth in recent years after the success of the Mega Man Anniversary Collection. 
and they really took things to the next level with this collection. With tons of different scaling options, scan lines, training modes, and online play for select games making this one of the most lavish compilations I've seen in a long time. But it's the museum section that really elevates us beyond the scope of the usual multi-game compilation. There's a ton of extra material here that is worth the price of entry all by itself. A timeline takes you through each game of the series' 30-year history, with material like artwork, factoids, and complete soundtracks. Although some might be disappointed that this only includes the arcade versions of each game. I mean, home ports would have been amazing, especially for games like Alpha 3, which had a ton of additional characters, but I really can't imagine a Street Fighter collection being better than this. A few years ago, near the start of the channel, we had an opportunity to make a trailer for an upcoming PC game from Secret Base called Devil's Dare. This multiplayer beat-em-up was a fun homage to arcade quarter munchers. In early 2018, Devil's Dare was ported to the PS4 and Switch under a new name, Streets of Red. This new version included a number of tweaks and changes from the original game, in addition to some new characters. From Final Fantasy VI to Zelda, there's some really fun nods to games and pop culture throughout. You never know who might show up, including Try and I in the background of the survival mode. I was not expecting that. Streets of Red is super fun to play multiplayer, and I loved revisiting this game with my friend Chris on a whim this past summer. KO. February saw the release of the Secret of Mana remake for the PS4. This version was largely scorned because of its bare-bones look that many felt didn't recreate the aesthetic of the original very accurately. I don't know, maybe these people were right, but there's just something about its jank and simplicity that I found endearing, and just flat out fun to play. I guess that's a testament to the core mechanics of the original. <laughs> I've really made a point to look at this remake for what it is, such as playing with the new arranged soundtrack without dismissing it outright. And you know what? Maybe it's not as good as the original, but it's not that bad either. Some tracks even surpass the original compositions. The original sprites were obviously incredible, but there is an appeal to crisp, simple graphics that make up this new version. I especially love the way that the area map is represented by the original game's graphics. Hey, bro? What? This Eleni witch wasn't always so scary, right? The voice acting is probably the worst part. Although I can dig the greater focus on each of the three main characters' personalities and their interactions. I'm still working my way through it, but this is a game that I'll pop in when I have a little bit of downtime. Don't let the word of mouth distract you too much from this. You might find yourself pleasantly surprised. I also finished an assortment of games for much older consoles in 2018. The nice thing about a lot of these is that even if they are indeed challenging, they are nonetheless short enough to beat an evening of streaming. In fact, it was during a January stream that I marked my first beat of 2018, Super Mario Bros. 2, the Japanese Super Mario Bros. 2 for the Famicom Disk System, that is. Unlike the Lost Levels version on SNES, which I finished a long time ago, the FDS original does not have the luxury of being able to save and continue from the start of every level. So I was always afraid to play by the original rules, which as you continue from the start of each world instead. But you know what? Even if it is more vindictive than other Mario games, I think it's possible to get through it with much less effort than plenty of other infamously difficult NES games. And I'd say any fan of classic Mario should make a serious go at it. But without a doubt, the best game I played on my Famicom in 2018 was Seirei Densetsu Lickle, the Japanese version of the infamously expensive Little Samson, which I found in Akihabara for less than 10% of the price of the American version. Little Samson may not be worth $1,500 or whatever it's going for these days, what game really could be, but it is extraordinarily good. 
Four playable characters equipped with their own unique abilities and great animations are just the beginning. This really is a top shelf NES platformer. No matter what method you have to use, I strongly encourage all fans of 8-bit platformers to play through it. One of the best NES cartridges I played this year was the widely celebrated classic, Karnov. <laughs> Okay, in all seriousness, Karnov is hardly beloved, and the character has become something of a joke for us here on My Life in Gaming. The game itself is not exactly great, but you know what? It's really not that bad. It plays like a mess, but there is a certain charm to its clumsiness, and with infinite continues at your disposal, it's not even that time-consuming to beat. And hey, who could hate a game whose label art features a dude breathing fire to T-Rex? Looking back, I'd say that I probably had the most fun with the PC Engine in 2018 than any other retro console. The first PC Engine slash Turbo Graphics game that I beat in 2018 was Legendary Axe. And what a game this is. With great gameplay and a great soundtrack, Legendary Axe deserves far more attention than it gets. Over the course of the game, you pick up items to increase your axe's maximum damage, but similar to games like Secret of Mana, you have to let your weapon meter fill back up to do the most damage. This creates an interesting pace for a platformer, making it a somewhat slower and more methodical action game where rushing forward too quickly is almost always a bad idea. However, there are also situations where it's helpful to just hold the attack button and let the turbo function do the work for you. It's tough, but very satisfying, and one of my favorite games on the system thus far. Another great one was Valkyrie no Densetsu, Namco's Legend of the Valkyrie. It may not have co-op like the arcade release, but this version is plenty of fun nonetheless. A charming overhead action game similar to the likes of Pocky and Rocky, littered with hidden magic and plenty of other secrets. The PC Engine CD version of Valus The Legend of the Phantasm Soldier is the second game in the series that I've played after the Genesis version of Valus 3. This one far exceeded my expectations. While Yuko is a very slow-moving character, the game has an excellent set of projectile weapons that can power up to three times each and are just a lot of fun to use. Yuko also has a quick slide that plays very well in many of the game's boss fights. The final boss in particular was extremely intense, and beating him on stream was definitely one of my personal favorite gaming moments of the year. <sighs> what? <gasps> you do it? Yeah. My heart is like pounding so hard. Of course I spent time with some classics this year, although not nearly as many as last. Most of the older games that I started on our Sunday night live stream, I never ended up returning to. Guess I should get better at that, huh? I finally got around to Rocket Knight Adventures this year, which I know, I know, I should have played this a long time ago. I'd always heard that it was a pretty tough game, and I guess that just had me procrastinating on it. Turns out it was the absolute perfect difficulty, and I even almost finished it on the hardest difficulty immediately after finishing it the first time. This is a game where you've really got to learn how each of the numerous boss encounters progress, but once you do, it's extremely fulfilling. Mastering each of the moves in your repertoire is important, and knowing when to use them is key. I think people get caught up on using the dash move, and they fail to realize that the basic sword slash is actually more powerful and much more versatile. It's a reasonably long game, but each level offers a completely different experience, which makes it move pretty quick and never gets old. This is 16-bit era Konami at its most refined, and it's incredible that this has never gotten any kind of re-release on download services. <laughs> Gate of Thunder is a TurboGrafx-16 CD game that I've always talked about in the past, but I finished it this year and it really made me settle on it being probably my favorite shooter of all time. There's not a whole lot of frills to it. I mean, weapon power-ups are fairly straightforward, 
but it's such a pure shooter experience that I find myself being able to come back to it repeatedly. A big allure is obviously the hard rock and soundtrack, which is a nearly perfect mix of wailing guitars and synths. If only the sound balance was a little bit better. But there are hacked versions out there that fix this up. I guess one of the things I love the most about it is that it's not insanely difficult, which can scare off a lot of people from playing shooters in the first place. The basic difficulty is beatable after enough attempts by anyone with a passing interest in shooting games. For those of you that want more of a challenge, you're definitely going to meet your match by switching to hard mode. While we're on the subject of the TurboGrafx CD-ROM, we gotta talk about FX Unit Yuki, the Henshin Engine. This successful Kickstarter game is a tribute to the PC Engine's life, with levels inspired by Rondo of Blood, Adventure Island, and even Magical Chase. Despite being a backer, I didn't follow the development of this too closely, so when it showed up this past summer, I was pleasantly surprised. Yuki's top-notch soundtrack really roped me in, and combined with its basic, yet fun platforming action, You've got a Kickstarter game that definitely delivered on its promise. I mean, there is a couple of weird graphical glitches here and there, but it seems to be pushing the hardware in ways that not a lot of games on the system did. But these should be cleared up in the eventual Dreamcast port that's on the way. Last year, I was exposed to the brilliance of Spanish developer Loco Molito, with the incredible ghouls and ghosts like Curse Castilla. This year, I had the pleasure to play his tribute to classic shooting games like Gradius in Super Hydra. Delta Lands. A corruption force has been detected in the sector. Engage. Okay, ready to rock, Colonel. Unit 87, take off. Like Castilla, Hydra takes the basic look and premise of its inspiration and streamlines the heck out of it. While dying in Gradius means that it might be impossible to finish, Hydra gives you additional weapons to add to your loadout after each level, allowing you to pick the best gun, bombs, and super weapon for each area. It may be tough as nails, but the level variety here makes for a very fulfilling ride. I really fell in love with Hydra when I hit the Space Armada, which are usually my favorite type of level in a game. One of the first games I finished this year was McDonald's Treasureland Adventure, which shouldn't be confused with the other McDonald's game, Global Gladiators. Treasureland Adventure stars creepy old Ronald McDonald and was one of the very first games from Treasure, who had this in development simultaneously with Gunstar Heroes. Yes, a McDonald's game was one of my favorites of the year, which sounds absolutely crazy to say out loud. But what can I say, the combination of interesting boss battles, tried and true platforming, and Ronald's bizarre jumping animation was extremely memorable to me. Perhaps the defining characteristic of the current generation of gaming for me has been the physical releases of smaller titles that in the previous generation probably would have been only available as digital downloads. You know, it certainly doesn't hurt that a lot of these games don't take that long to beat, so that's always nice when I'm lacking for playtime. One of the most unique games I played through in the past year was Severed by Drinkbox Studios, the developer behind the excellent Guacamelee, which I also played this year via the physical release from V Blank Entertainment. Severed was originally released in 2016, and I played the 2018 Vita physical release by PlayAsia. In Severed, you play as a girl trying to save her family from an extremely twisted alternate dimension. Navigating through an old-school first-person dungeon crawler perspective, RPG battles play out with a unique touch-based battle system where you slash enemies and sever monster parts to collect and spend on character upgrades. While I feel that gameplay would probably be more comfortable with Wii Remote-style pointer controls instead of a touchscreen, the battle system is unconventional in a good way and it works better than you might expect. Severed manages to build a truly creepy world with such a simple art style. 
and the haunting soundtrack becomes more oppressive as the game progresses. So if you have any room in your heart for touch input, give it a try on Vita, Wii U, 3DS, Switch, or iOS. Earlier in the year, Limited Run Games did a PS4 release of Caro Blaster by the creator of Cave Story, but it's a very different, more linear sort of action game. It plays great, sounds great, and of course has a very charming style, though I don't think it ever took hold in the collective gaming consciousness to the extent that Cave Story did. The long-awaited Owlboy came to the Nintendo Switch in 2018, and I thought it was a perfect fit for the portable screen. This is a surprisingly story-driven little adventure, less Metroid-y than I expected, but full of fun action and great moments. Easily one of the best games I beat in 2018 was Cuphead, but that sadly was not on a physical copy. Hopefully Microsoft does the right thing in 2019 and gives us a fully patched Xbox One physical disc with the DLC included. In 2018, I tried to start a tradition that I only about half lived up to. The idea was to pick a game that I love, play through it once every month of the year, and in doing so, I would learn it well enough over the course of a year's worth of runs to add it to my stable of games that I could in the future pick up just for a casual replay anytime. For 2018, I chose the original Castlevania for NES. While I only ended up actually playing through it five or six times instead of the intended 12, I did manage to get good enough to finish in under 30 minutes without using any continues. We'll see if I can retain those skills over the coming years. The most interesting thing I learned along the way was that while Dracula is stunlocked by holy water, you can just walk straight through him. Thanks to Sefi for dropping the hot tips in the stream chat. Of course, I played a number of other games in 2018, but there's just no way to talk about all of them here and some like Kirby Star Allies, maybe I'll get the chance to go more in depth with that in a future episode. There were also some disappointments. Life is Strange Before the Storm told a thoroughly unexciting prequel story that absolutely did not need to be told. Danganronpa V3 had its moments, but sort of drove the series into the ground by the end. And while well, I've already talked plenty about Perfect Dark Zero in its own episode. But on the bright side, Perfect Dark Zero also led me to rediscover the greatness of Time Splitters 2. Wow, what a game! So good! Of course, this year was met with its fair share of disappointments, and probably the biggest for me was Shadow of the Tomb Raider. I was a huge fan of the first game in this reboot series, playing through it a number of times on both the PS3 and the PS4. I had a lot of fun with Rise as well, but ultimately came away feeling a bit ambivalent about it. Regardless, I was still excited for Shadow, starting it fairly close to release. It was also the first game I played fully in 4K with HDR. And it starts out pretty great. The atmosphere and graphics are fantastic in the early parts of the Cozumel section. But then, a story beat happens and absolutely killed my opinion of Lara's character, which made it really tough to get into the rest of the narrative. By the end, I didn't feel any kind of attachment to the world or the plot. I could barely understand what the lead villain's motivation was, but I kind of felt like Lara was just as bad. You set the apocalypse in motion. Do you realize the tragedy you have unleashed? Believe me, this isn't the kind of thing that usually bothers me, but she just comes across as supremely unlikable in this game. Cleansing has begun. It falls to me now to stop it before it consumes us all. Shadow takes more of an open world approach, which is usually a negative for me. The same thing happened with the transition from Batman Arkham Asylum to Arkham City. But it didn't help that the power progression of equipment and Lara's skills felt almost entirely useless this time around. Of course, it was still a great looking game, and the HDR was stunning but what a way to fizzle out on the finale of this reboot series. I have a feeling that they'll need to retool everything from the ground up for whatever direction Lara heads in next.
firmly in the what the heck, this is a mess column is Arc Systems Double Dragon 4. On paper and in screenshots, this is the kind of throwback I can get behind, taking inspiration from the NES version of Double Dragon 2. In action though, I have no idea what happened here. The screen tearing is absolutely out of control and completely destroys whatever potential there is for this being a retro revival on the same scale as Mega Man 9. I'd heard that this game was rushed out with no real testing, but it's insane that this has never been fixed via patch even today. Talk about being sent to die, and also betraying consumers' trust. This was such a colossal waste. This next one might ruffle some feathers, but I didn't have a lot of fun with Axiom Verge. To be clear, I'm not saying that it's a bad game, but it just didn't resonate with me at all, which is disappointing because I expected to like it a lot more than I did. It has a really interesting plot that goes in unexpected directions, along with some unique power-ups and gameplay mechanics, but I felt like by the end, every button on the controller did something different and it felt overly complicated, making it especially difficult to play on the Switch in portable mode. The music and world had atmosphere so thick, but I don't know, maybe I'm just bored of Metroidvanias nowadays. But maybe not, because the messenger was freaking awesome. What starts out as an homage to Ninja Gaiden, and some of the intense platforming of Super Meat Boy, eventually expands into a time-traveling Metroidvania with a mix of 8 and 16-bit graphics. I was unsure about the writing at first because it felt a bit too jokey, but the story of the game evolved in such a way that I got really into it. This is a pretty lengthy adventure too, and it ended up being far longer than I ever expected. There's such a fluidity to the gameplay in The Messenger that truly makes you feel like you can do anything. And by the end of the game, you basically can. It doesn't overcomplicate things. You have your entire moveset about a quarter of the way into the game. A stark contrast to Axiom Verge. Now, to see the Metroidvania formula perfected, you need only look at what was probably my most anticipated release of this year. Monster Boy and the Cursed Kingdom. Your journey began, it's time to go. The power of change really... An incredible new entry in the Wonder Boy series, which ended up being both of our favorite game of the year. You know a game is special when you really start arranging your schedule around playing the game. If a game is good enough, you find time to play it. Sometimes at the expense of other things you should be doing. What impresses me most about Monster Boy is that the game is not afraid to challenge you in ways that other games shy away from. The action is perfectly tuned, often demanding a lot of precision, while still being forgiving enough to let you try and try again. I'm not talking like Meat Boy levels of ridiculousness or anything, but it's just the right level of difficulty for fans of old school platforming. Much more platforming challenge than you might normally expect to see in Metroidvania style games. Exactly, and not just that, I felt that Monster Boy really makes you think in a way that feels all but lost in modern gaming. Puzzle solutions, especially those that lead to enticing optional upgrades, are typically not at all obvious at a glance. It seems like most games these days really don't want the player to feel confused for too long, but Monster Boy's puzzles are such that you might often have to walk away and come back later. But in the end, the solutions are very satisfying and make perfect sense. There's something to discover on basically every single screen, and between Try and I, we were able to solve nearly every mystery in the game before any FAQs or other information was available, which made for a super fulfilling experience. Not only is Monster Boy Game of the Year for both of us, the soundtrack has to easily be the best of the year too. With an all-star music team including Yuzo Koshiro, Michiru Yamane, and others, the most surprising thing is that even with its excellent remixes of past Monster World series themes, these are often debatably overshadowed by the incredible original compositions. 
Is this the best grassy field theme of all time? As 2018 closes, I regret that I haven't had time to play some of the year's biggest titles. No, I still haven't played Spider-Man, God of War, and perhaps most unfortunately, Dragon Quest XI. But these games aren't going anywhere, and won't be less good when I undoubtedly make time for them in 2019. An important takeaway is that a good game is always a good game, no matter when you play it. And I hope to find many more in the coming year. As 2019, and well, the entire decade wraps up, it's once again time to reflect on the games that we played over the course of this year. It's important to remember that, as is our tradition, this isn't your typical yearly list that you tend to see elsewhere. We played a bunch of games this year, and most of them weren't the latest and greatest. Some of them might not have even been that good, but they all left an impression on us in one way or another. So let's get started. These are the games that we played in 2019. When former Rare developers Playtonic Games brought ukulele to Kickstarter in 2015, N64 fans came out of the woodwork to support the project and records were shattered in mere minutes. But when the game was delivered in 2017, the reception seemed a bit less enthusiastic, although I generally figured it was just the usual case of people forgetting how to love old fashioned games. So when I finally got the game for a Nintendo Switch this year, I resolved to judge it for myself. And ultimately, yes, the game does feel a touch rough around many edges, particularly camera and controls. Whether time, budget, or the Unity engine is to blame, I don't know. But regardless, I feel Ukulele accomplishes what it set out to do. It's a game about poking your head into every corner, finding things, and figuring out how to get those things. Ukulele gives the player five huge worlds to explore. Yes, only five, but each world has quite a lot of content and can be expanded to have even more to do after a certain number of PGs have been collected. The world expansion is an interesting mechanic, although I did wish the worlds were just fully featured from the get-go. After a rather slow start, I found myself really getting into a groove with the game. It's extremely non-linear and generally does not guide you to acquire necessary or useful moves before attempting to go for particular items, which I actually found to be a refreshing change of pace over Ukulele's main inspiration, Banjo-Kazooie. I found Banjo to be much less replayable than many other N64 games in some ways because it's almost too perfect. Ukulele is much less afraid to let you approach a situation in a way that feels wrong and allow you to succeed while doing so. For example, maybe you already unlocked an ability that lets you skip part of a challenge, or perhaps you're missing an ability, but you find a way to brute force your way through part of a level anyway. It's this sort of flexibility that truly brings me the feelings of nostalgia, a flexibility that games like Mario 64 and Goldeneye excel in, while Banjo-Kazooie felt almost too carefully planned out. So despite what you may have heard, Ukulele is still worth playing. Just don't forget what it's supposed to be. <laughs> Little did I know that later in the year I would be playing Playtonic's next game, and that it would bring the Lizard and Bat duo back for a radically different game. A game that makes me very, very happy. Ukulele and the Impossible Layer is Playtonic's updated take on the old Donkey Kong Country style of gameplay, and if you know me, the DKC trilogy on SNES is just about the pinnacle of platforming to me. 
anyone who tries to tell you that those games were just about the graphics are dead wrong. And the more recent DKC games by Retro Studios, I won't say they're bad, and I'll admit I kinda like Tropical Freeze, but they do not adhere to the game design sensibilities of Rare's trilogy in the slightest. In contrast, Impossible Lair feels like where Rare might have taken Donkey Kong Country in the Wii era had they not been bought by Microsoft. Mind you, it's not exactly the same as the games that inspired it. The level design feels more focused on exploration than rhythmic rolls and bounces off chains of enemies, although there is that kind of stuff too, and the mechanics are excellent. So it feels like the natural evolution of DKC by many of the very same people who made it, rather than a straight up copy. Contributing to that feeling of evolution is the absolutely delightful overworld. At first I expected this overhead exploration and puzzle solving section of the game to feel like a chore that would kill the game's pace, but it turned out to be one of my favorite parts about the whole thing. It really ties everything together in such a cohesive way that makes Ukulele and the Impossible Layer feel like a fully realized sequel that is so much more polished and fleshed out than the original. I actually haven't quite finished the game just yet. The impossible layer itself can be challenged at any point, and while playing through the rest of the game makes the layer much more possible, it's still pretty difficult, and longer than I expected too. So I still need to get back to attempting it, but I still had to include the game on my list because it has absolutely been one of my top favorites of the year. <laughs> One of the most anticipated crowdfunded games to date finally released in 2019, four years after its very successful Kickstarter campaign, Bloodstained Ritual of the Night. But the long and tumultuous development, along with some unimpressive early previews, seemed to foster a sense among the public that Koji Igarashi's long-awaited Castlevania spiritual successor would almost certainly fall well short of the hype. But having beaten the game myself, I'd say that those reservations were unfounded, and if anything, maybe they fueled the team to finish strong. And while the Switch version has some difficult technical issues that it may never totally overcome, anyone playing on other platforms will find an excellent experience. What I found so striking about Bloodstained was not simply how well it evokes the feeling of a style of Castlevania game that we haven't seen since Order of Ecclesia in 2008, but really how successfully it serves as a spiritual successor to 1997's Symphony of the Night in particular. There's an undirected openness about your approach to exploring the castle, and a welcome mystery and obtuseness about how to proceed beyond dead-end endings on a handful of occasions. I swore to you that I would stop you if your Shardbinder power ever manifested itself against your will. You made the same oath to me. <gasps> Please! You think I wield this power unwillingly? This is not a game that holds your hand, tells you what to do, or where to go. You find your own way, and the game gives you just enough information to figure it out, but you do have to pay attention to small details. While the Game Boy Advance and DS Castlevanias have some of those elements too, the particular ways in which Bloodstained reminds me of Symphony of the Night have only served to increase my appreciation of both games. It's clear that Igarashi spent a lot of time reflecting on not only what made Symphony of the Night and the Castlevania games that followed so well loved, but also why Symphony of the Night was still generally considered to be the best of its ilk. Metroidvania, or whatever you prefer to call them, has become such an overused genre in indie gaming today, a style of game that I still love but feel a bit weary of at times. So it's been really special seeing one of the master producers of the genre return and show us how it's done with a new game that, in my opinion, equals his best works. Yeah! 
originally released on Xbox Live Arcade in 2012, I finally played the widely acclaimed Dust and Elysian Tale via the physical release on Nintendo Switch by Limited Run Games. I knew very little going into the game other than it was mostly made by one person, is apparently good, and the characters were animals of some kind. I expected to probably like it, but I found myself much more taken by the game than I expected. The main draw here is the combat. It's just a lot of fun, with most encounters pitting you against large numbers of enemies that you can fling around the screen however you wish. The mysterious protagonist, Dust, is extraordinarily powerful, and the game does an excellent job of making you believe he really could take on endless hordes of monsters and soldiers as a one-man army. Well, a one-man army greatly assisted by his small orange flying companion, Fidget. Dust has your basic XY attack combo system, but it's not overly complicated. Fidget casts small spells that Dust can magnify with his whirlwind blade attack, which can really rack up the hit counter for some nice bonus experience. It might look chaotic, but it's actually quite manageable overall. But when you do get hit, even on normal, it tends to really hurt, so I wonder how tough the game is on the highest difficulties. RPG elements are solid and don't feel tacked on, making for noticeable jumps in power as the game progresses. Exploration looks Metroid-esque at a glance, but areas are sectioned off by a world map, and overall I would compare it to something more straightforward like a Vanillaware game than Metroid or Castlevania. My biggest complaint with Dust is that the character art has a somewhat amateur look to it, with a very basic inking and shading style, feeling rather like something you'd see in an early 90s CD game, Although, to be fair, I kind of got a working designs vibe from the characters and writing, so maybe that's what the game's creator, Dean Dodrill, was going for. My name is Dust, and this is Fidget. Hiya! Don't mind Mr. Grumpy. He's not big on the whole eye contact thing. Dust himself has excellent animation, however, and the backgrounds and environmental effects are quite beautifully rendered. Despite expecting a good game, I got more out of Dust than I thought I would. Even though this is technically a last-gen digital download title, it still holds up great in the areas where it counts. The start of 2019 was all about unfinished business for me. Heading into the year, I had a couple of games in progress that I felt were necessary to wrap up. The first of which was Sega's Fists of the North Star Lost Paradise from Ryo Ga Gotaku Studio. I hope I pronounced that right. You know, the developers of the Yakuza games. This was my first time diving into one of their games, so I wasn't quite sure what to expect. I have a faint memory of seeing the Fists of the North Star anime on TV in the 90s. It had an amazing look to it, but it was so heavily censored it was completely nonsensical. Lost Paradise is the recent in a long line of Sega developed Fist of the North Star games, or as it's called in Japan, Hakuto no Ken. The first game came out all the way back in 1986 on the Mark III, and was reskinned on the Master System as Black Belt. The hero of all the Fist of the North Star games is Kenshiro, a master of a martial art called Hakuto Shinken, which deals certain death by applying pressure to a variety of pressure points on the human body. Anybody who gets on Ken's bad side, chances are, they're most likely already dead, and it's only a matter of time before someone erupts into a geyser of blood. The Yakuza games are well known for offering a ton of side quests, and there's no shortage of that here. Although the real meat of the story takes place in the city of Eden, where Ken can take on tons of odd jobs, some to move the plot along, others are just meant to be ridiculous. For a change of scenery, head outside of the city walls into the wasteland where you can play baseball with dudes on motorcycles, or hunt for treasures like classic Sega arcade games. Despite being a man of few words, Kenshiro was the most interesting and entertaining aspect of the story. He is one serious dude, and I can appreciate that. His stoicism lends an understated sense of humor, and I love that he applies a level of intensity to everything that he does, no matter how trivial. To that end, it's clear that the developers reveled in putting Ken into situations where he looked out of place and silly, yet he still manages to excel at any given task.
The other big holdover from 2018 was Resident Evil 7, which I began in early November. Ever since it was first revealed, I couldn't have been less interested in the first-person point of view, but the major factor in inciting this change was the release of the PlayStation VR headset, and Resident Evil 7 was poised to be the killer app. When I finally got myself a PSVR in late 2018, that's when I figured it was finally time. Well, this is horrifying. One of the scariest movies I've ever seen is the original Texas Chainsaw Massacre. It's not so much the violence, because there's very little of it actually on screen, but the tension combined with the grime and filth that covers everything gives it a uniquely unsettling and imposing aura. RE7 taps into this, but playing in VR takes it up several notches, where it suddenly stops being fun in a traditional sense, and becomes a mentally exhausting experience, which I suppose is the point. That's cool. <laughs> Mind if I take a little spin? Okay. <laughs> oh, jeez. Okay. Uh. Oh. <laughs> With those two commitments wrapped up, it was about time for me to take on one of 2018's most anticipated releases, Marvel's Spider-Man. So, I gotta say that few genres bore me more these days than open world. I'm so sick of giant maps with busy work icons strewn haphazardly across a map, and would much rather have a clear progression that unfolds naturally. What I'm saying is, give me Arkham Asylum, not Arkham City. But the praise for Spider-Man was insane. The timing seemed right, but it just didn't grab me. It didn't help at all that I found the character himself to be pretty mundane in recent years. So, I quit and moved on to something else. Ah, just kidding. One chilly Saturday afternoon, I took my kids to see the animated Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse movie before it left theaters. And it was crazy good. It totally revived my interest in the character, and that night I returned to the game and was completely invested until I reached the finale a few days later. What a turnaround, right? In my eyes, an open world game lives and dies by the way that you move from mission to mission. Insomniac Games has done an excellent job with the sense of scale and your ability to move through the environment, making you feel empowered to explore. It's fun, and more importantly, fast. It never feels like a chore to gather collectibles on the way to your next destination. And the detours are only as long as you want them to be. It's cliche, but you really do feel like a superhero. And then, we have Tetris Effect, a game that drew rave reviews upon its release in 2018, but presented a bit of a conundrum for me. See, I'm a fan of Tetsuya Mizuguchi's more action-based efforts, such as Rez and Child of Eden, but his puzzle games, such as Luminous, eh, they never really seemed to rope me in. So when I saw that he was doing a Tetris game, it could go either way. I like a good falling block puzzler, but I rarely ever put in the time required to get good. But, whoa, this is a breathtaking experience. The light and colors form in the shapes in your periphery, while the sound of music lull you into a trance. Tetris is no longer a game, it has a life of its own. The soundtrack is absolutely incredible, I just can't get over it. You feel the music in this game more than any other that I can think of. The last level of the journey mode really showed me how little I understood about Tetris. I guess I just didn't fully understand how things fit together and what patterns I was looking for. It was a humbling experience and it took me a lot longer than I'd like to admit to finish. But then, I kept going. And going. This is probably the last Tetris game I need or want because I'm not sure if it could ever be topped. With the word of mouth surrounding Control this year, it might seem a bit odd I chose instead to play Quantum Break for my Remedy fix. I've been a fan of theirs since the first Max Payne, and even though I don't tend to play their games on day one, I haven't been let down by anything with Sam Lake's involvement yet. I came back home to see my best friend, Paul Serene. He wanted to show me what he'd been working on. My brother Will was a scientist. He was also involved. Paul said it was world-changing. 
things right. Coming off the supernatural high of Alan Wake, I was interested in Remini's take on time travel. Quantum Break had a prolonged gestation period and released to a muted reception and quickly faded away. It's an extremely ambitious project, melding a game with a live action TV show. I was surprised at how these two things only crossed paths a couple of times, with the show focusing on characters that are more off to the side of the main story. Liam. The use of the two storytelling mediums immediately annoyed me because of the time investment required to actually start the game. Now, I'm fine with that, but just don't plan on starting the game the same day that you first put the disc in. That said, the story is the main reason to play Quantum Break in the first place, so I'd recommend committing to watching the show as you play. Time travel can be a mentally taxing thing when you really get into the nitty gritty, and this was a take on the subject I've never seen before. The method of time travel is unique, and the game seems to strictly adhere to the rules that it sets for itself. Your first journey back in time, 2010. This is where our notes get hazy. No matter how frustrating it is for you and the characters, the past absolutely cannot be changed. History always plays out as it's always existed, no matter how many times the characters try to alter it because their interference was one of the many moving parts that actually make the events happen in the way that they did. The way this idea plays out for certain characters really struck a chord with me. Unfortunately, the gameplay didn't have the same kind of impact. I've learned by now that Remedy shooters are always competently made, but this is a fairly typical cover shooter with some neat powers that spice up certain encounters. Still, the overall mediocrity of Quantum Break won't deflate me from checking out Control. Word is that it's much better, and I've heard that it even has some sort of connection to Alan Wake. Yeah, I'm into that. And then, we have Death Stranding, without a doubt the most divisive new game released this year. From its reveal several years ago, I was curious to see what Hideo Kojima was going to make when he had no restrictions or expectations. I went into the game completely dark which I feel is probably the best approach for something as bizarre and unconventional as this. The last thing I expected was a post-apocalyptic visual representation of a Sigur Rós album. I don't know if I would call Death Stranding fun exactly, but it was strangely compelling. Only Kojima could get away with turning a game about slow-paced cargo delivery into a AAA game, but it mostly works for me. I've always enjoyed trekking across game worlds on foot, taking in the sights, and seeing if I can climb up to some ridiculous point that seems nearly unreachable. It's such a shame that after spending so long building the Fox engine at Konami, Kojima barely got to use it. Regardless, this is one of the most beautiful games I have ever played. You're encouraged to take in the sights and sounds of the world as you pass it by, and when you scale a ridge to see your destination in the distance, it's simply awe-inspiring and relieving. I really love the sound design as well. Simple little things such as the sound of BB's hands hitting the glass of their container gives a sense of reality to the world, which isn't something I can recall feeling in a game that often. BB. I go into a Kojima game knowing he's going to fling me around, laugh at my misfortune, and he's going to make me listen to characters yammer on and on and on and throw around crazy acronyms, and honestly, I wouldn't have it any other way. I play a Kojima game for the Kojima experience, and Death Stranding is undeniably very Kojima. Man, it's nice seeing him get to create a new concept from scratch for the first time in a very long while. This is about as slow of a burn as any game I have ever played. There's a lot of information you have to take in before heading out with your cargo. And it really made my head spin at first. I teetered between calling it quits and having a decent time. I was probably driven almost exclusively by the curiosity of whether or not any of this would make sense by the end. I wouldn't want to spoil the story, but I will say that by the midway point, I was totally hooked with such a bizarre setup that seemed nearly unexplainable ever since the first couple of trailers, I really didn't expect to ever understand what was going on. But ultimately, the game led up to what was for me a thoroughly satisfying conclusion. I'll be waiting for you on the beach. Come and find me. Uh, 
After I finished Death Stranding, I was still in the mood for another state-of-the-art technical showpiece sort of game, but maybe one that wasn't nearly so long. And as maybe a six or seven hour long game, Hellblade Sinua's Sacrifice fit the bill perfectly. The unfortunate title sounds like it came out of a high schooler's notebook and doesn't really match the vibe of the game. That there's nothing to go back to at all. Stay still, stay quiet, hide, don't tell her. Their gods can see into your mind. They will use this power to destroy you. They won't stop me. Senua suffers from a sort of psychosis, and the game uses it extremely effectively not only to tell her story, but also to facilitate gameplay in ways that feel very fresh. Senua is a Celtic woman who seeks the Norse underworld based on stories she's been told by a friend who had dealings with Vikings. Different voices rattle around in Senua's head almost constantly, talking amongst themselves and making observations about her situation some inquisitive, observant, or encouraging, others cautious, pessimistic, and mocking. Open it. <laughs> she has to. Not from this side. This allows the game to feed the player information with no tutorial or HUD to speak of. It pushes the player to figure out for themselves how they can interact with the world, how they might solve puzzles, and what might have changed after interacting with a door or lever without being explicitly told, and I absolutely loved this approach. This carries over to the game's simple but fierce combat system, where the voices might help the player learn how different enemies open themselves to attack, or warn of enemies approaching from the rear. Behind you. I really loved the enemy designs too. I thought they were rather frightening, and in general, the game has much more of a horror vibe than I was expecting. The recently released trailer for Sinua's Saga looks particularly creepy too, so I can't wait to see what Ninja Theory does with what I presume is planned as a much bigger game. I'm not sure I would have believed you if you told me last year that not only would I have beaten the PS4 version of Dragon Quest XI in 2019, but I would also play the entirety of its lengthy post-game to reach the true ending. And I would then proceed to start it all over again and get through most of the Switch version when it released later in the year. But that is exactly what I did. I wouldn't want to spoil a thing, but if you love good traditional Japanese RPGs, then Dragon Quest XI is definitely for you. I don't think it quite tops Dragon Quest VIII or IV in my book, but I'd say it rests comfortably around the third place spot alongside Dragon Quest III. My only particular complaint would be that I actually prefer random encounters, for Dragon Quest anyway. Enemies are simply too easy to avoid, and the game does not demand terribly much from you in terms of levels until later, so as a result the world just doesn't feel dangerous, which is something I've always appreciated when roaming the fields in Dragon Quest and hoping I can make it through a dungeon and on to the next town. We win again. Luckily, with the Switch version's 2D mode, that problem is solved. Encounters are random, and battles move breezily. And while I would still say that I consider the 3D mode to be more of the true version of the game, 2D mode has been extremely efficient and enjoyable for a replay. More different than I expected, too. While event triggers largely remain the same, town and dungeon layouts tend to be radically different. Some field areas in 3D mode are actually large stretches of world map in 2D mode. And while the 2D mode's presentation does have some slight visual quirks, I'm still glad that this version of the game managed to get life beyond the Japan-exclusive 3DS release. River City Ransom is one of the NES's most ahead-of-its-time games, with such a huge degree of freedom when it comes to your approach to taking on the world. So when I learned that Way Forward, who is one of my favorite American developers, was putting their own spin on the Kunio-kun series with River City Girls, I was immediately interested. I've 
liked the Kunio games that I played in the past, but a more modern aesthetic seemed like a perfect evolution of the style. After the underappreciated Double Dragon Neon, I'd basically trust WayForward with just about any beat em up series. Although I only had a chance to play it in single player, I was pretty hooked to the end. Like the original, it's much more difficult at the start until you figure out how to power up your character sufficiently. As a bit of disclosure, I actually worked on a few of the pre-release trailers for River City Girls, so I had some idea of what I was getting into ahead of time. And even still, the game was more fun than I expected. Having played it in co-op on the backloggery stream with our good friend Drumble, I might have had a somewhat easier time than Corey did. And I absolutely loved the stomp to revive your friend before their ghost flies away concept. Definitely one of the best and funniest co-op mechanics I've seen. It kept tension high during boss fights without making revival trivial. Did we do it? Did we do it? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> 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 it was a freaking yeah. fight. <laughs> The combat just feels great and is complemented by truly excellent sprite animation that makes it all the more fun to dish out the pain. The worlds of Kunio and Double Dragon have been slowly colliding over the years, but it seems like they've finally committed to them existing in the same universe. <laughs> Nobody beats my prices! I got a real kick out of this game's sense of humor, but the soundtrack is the real star of the show, topping even Double Dragon Neons, and that was one of my favorite soundtracks of last generation. Like that, oftentimes the best tracks are those with lyrics, and this definitely had me checking out more Megan McDuffie's work. All these factors came together in what was ultimately one of the best beat em ups in years. <laughs> Indeed, River City Girls was just one of many retro style games that I played this year. But before we get into that, can we talk for a minute just how good of a year it's been for Sega fans? Not even taking into account the Sega Ages releases on the Switch, which I have to mention because every time Space Harrier gets ported to a modern console, I'll buy it no questions asked. But more than any other time that I can think of, there was a lavish amount of attention put on the Genesis. Despite the unfortunate sound delay issue, Sega's own Genesis Mini was a great little all-in-one console for a more casual audience but it was the enthusiast community that truly paid proper homage to the console and its add-ons legacy. The analog Mega SG was immaculately designed both inside and out as a great standalone console for people who wanted to play their original cartridges in high definition and as authentically as possible. Terra Onion's Mega SD was able to at long last incorporate Sega's CD-ROM functionality into a flash cart. I'd say it's the most essential peripheral for Sega fans. And then you have the much anticipated Xeno Crisis a homebrew Sega Genesis game from the UK-based Bitmap Bureau that was kickstarted in late 2017. This top-down arcade-style shooter is reminiscent of Smash TV, mixed with a Space Marine aesthetic akin to James Cameron's Aliens, and it is awesome. This is one of the largest Genesis carts ever made, and it's easy to see it on display. It's clear that the team at Bitmap Bureau know their Z80, because the sprite work is absolutely incredible, with huge bosses being especially impressive. The soundtrack by Savage Regime is just as good as the word of mouth would make you think. It pushes the Genesis of sound hardware in ways that is probably never meant to go. But this is one tough game. There's a bunch of different weapons that pop up to help you out, but even your basic machine gun needs ammo refills, which means you always gotta be on the move. Between each level, you can redeem your collected dog tags to power up various attributes, but you can really only ever afford to upgrade one or two stats at a time, so you gotta choose carefully. I need to mention just how nice the physical cartridge version that Bitmap Bureau is selling directly is. No expense was spared, and the cart PCB was designed by Rene of DB Electronics, so you can buy it with confidence that it was correctly engineered and manufactured in a way that doesn't pose a threat to the console. While we're on the topic of the Genesis, I played a lot of shooters on the system this year. This is a bit of a shock because while I like the genre in general, I've just never been very good at them. But I think I might be getting better with age. 
probably most famous online as Mark from Classic Game Room's favorite game. Truxton from Toaplan was a challenging little vertical shooter. I'm not ashamed to say that I played through it on easy mode, which offered unlimited continues, but still offered significant challenge. Expect to be ambushed from behind fairly often and die before you know it. To me, there's two things that really make a shooter memorable, weapon loadout and music. There's some nice power-ups in this game, with the multi-directional blue lightning being my favorite. Of course, the skull-shaped smart bomb explosion is probably the most well-known image from the game. Music, on the other hand, eh, I can take it or leave it. Oh, did I do it? Really? Was that it? You have one, and Daguruva is defeated. <laughs> you may have escaped, but I'll get you next time. The other Toaplane shooter that I finally built up the courage to take on was Hellfire, or as I like to call it, Heckfire. I had the US version when I was a kid, but because I could never make it past the second level, I somehow decided that it was the most difficult shooter I'd ever played. Since Toplin is mainly known for their vertically scrolling shooters, Hellfire doesn't seem to be all that well regarded. It has some interesting play mechanics, where you cycle through weapons that can shoot in different directions, but other than that, there's not a whole lot to set it apart. My fear of Hellfire's difficulty stayed with me for years until we were making the Mega SG video in March. I had to record footage from it in particular because it's known to have some sound speed issues on certain hardware revisions. In doing so, I realized that maybe it's not such an insurmountable game after all, and resolved to finish it by the end of the year. Although I wasn't able to do that, I think I'll be able to take it down in the early portions of 2020. One of the first games I bought for my Sega Genesis after getting it for Christmas in 1989 was Technosoft's Thunder Force 2. While I thought it was okay, the overhead segments definitely impacted the fun factor for me. Now, Thunder Force 3 is one of the defining shooters on the system, and I was finally able to get a copy of my own during our visit to Japan last year to shoot the M2 Complete Works documentary. This game trounces part two in every department, except maybe when it comes to the music. It's much more fast-paced and has perhaps the best weapon lineup I've seen in any 16-bit shooter. It's also quite a bit easier, so much so that I was shocked to finish it during one of our live streams. This is the first game in the series that I've been able to complete. And a peaceful time came soon. It might be for a short time. Human, human beings, think about what you have done. <laughs> <laughs> And finally, Game Art's Silphied on the Sega CD was pitched by magazines back in the day as the Star Fox Killer. The similarities are undeniable, polygon graphics and the 3D point of view being the most obvious. But once you see it in motion, the comparison starts to break down. Silphied's backgrounds are primarily full motion video window dressing with very limited interactivity versus Star Fox more freely maneuverable environments. But as you probably know by now, I love me some rail shooters. And the space armadas and the trench runs makes for some larger than life encounters, even if it is mostly just for show. I beat a decent handful of old games for the first time this past year. But my favorite new to me game of 2019 is simply No Contest. The original Ape Escape for PlayStation is so clever and outstanding that I feel whether it's 2019 or 1999, its quality hasn't diminished in the slightest. In fact, I feel that playing Ape Escape two decades after its release may have only increased my appreciation for it, because there's a playfulness to the controls that simply does not feel like anything made today. Ape Escape was the first PlayStation game to require a dual analog controller. 
With free reign to use all of the features of the DualShock, it seems to me that Sony's new Japan studio must have approached their first game with a special gusto that can only be mustered when you feel you are doing something that could not previously be done without a very unique tool with untapped potential. Rather than gimmicky, the result is something that feels fresh in a, dare I say, Super Mario 64-esque kind of way. Really, I don't know what Sony had in mind when they included two sticks, because games like Spyro the Dragon simply left camera rotation on the shoulder buttons, so it took some number of years before right stick camera control became the rarely violated norm that it is today. But the team behind Ape Escape had a much bigger imagination for how the right stick might be used. The main goal of the game is of course catching all of the brainwashed monkeys, which can be located with the assistance of the monkey radar, which you direct with the right stick while running around, and then caught with the time net, which you swing in the direction pressed by the right stick. Other favorite gadgets of mine are the sky flyer, which you spin with the right stick and just feels fun to use and the RC car, which can be moved independently of Spike with the right stick and can access areas that he can't. There are even objects in the levels that can be manipulated in fun ways using both sticks, like the paddles in a canoe. You know what a huge N64 fan I am, so I wouldn't say this lightly, but I now honestly believe Ape Escape is the second best 3D platformer of its generation after Super Mario 64, even ahead of all of Rare's offerings. Modern games simply don't play like Ape Escape, and I just had so much fun with it. I hear that the PS2 sequels, which I've already bought, have similar control schemes, so I really can't wait to see where this unique platforming series went next. But I have to bring up one last classic for the year. So if you remember in 2018, I started a tradition to pick a game that I would pledge to play through once a month for the whole year, with the goal of being to get to know it really well and increase my appreciation for it even more. I didn't exactly pull off the 12 months of playthroughs, but I did get pretty darn decent at Castlevania 1. Well, in 2019, I chose to play something a bit more outside the common list of NES favorites, Ninja Gaiden 3. You might have heard me rave before about how this is secretly the best Ninja Gaiden game, and I will stand firm by that statement. It has perhaps the best level design of any game on NES. There's just a flow to it that is unmatched, and the enemy and item placement is simply exquisite. It's a very, very learnable game. And once you figure out the best way to proceed through an area, it's just a beautiful thing. My idea for this year was to get really good at the far easier Famicom version and then graduate to the NES cartridge. The Famicom version is actually not all that difficult. The finely tuned level design makes it a pretty breezy romp with its infinite continues and generous checkpoints. The NES version plays like a hard mode. A few more enemies, you take more damage, limited checkpoints, and you only have five continues. Which, aside from having a pretty dumb story, is why it's usually considered the least favorite in the series. But it's actually a very well-balanced hard mode. While I didn't play the Famicom version nearly as many times as I intended to this year, I made one last minute effort on the final backloggery stream before Christmas to give the NES version my first serious go. It took a couple of attempts, but I finally beat it on my second to last life on the final continue of my third run of the night. What a game! And without a doubt, my most satisfying game accomplishment of 2019. It's not a big deal. It's just a small area that you're in. It's not a big deal. Yes, 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 yes. <laughs> It's been well established at this point that the Switch is absolutely perfect for games with a more retro-inspired artistic vision. Maybe it has to do with the abundance of era-appropriate controllers on the system, 
or the fact that you generally don't have to worry about hardware capability. I might not be a gigantic racing fan, but I do love arcade racers. So when I heard that Horizon Chase Turbo was getting a physical release in the US, I had to jump on it. I heard it was a lot like OutRun, but I'm not so sure that the comparison is all that apt. Sure, it has a great look, runs silky smooth, and some great music, but I much prefer OutRun's level progression versus Horizon Chase's individual lap-based races. Of course, I haven't finished the World Tour mode, so maybe something like that will unlock later on. Still, it's great in short bursts and has a ton of content, so arcade fans should see if this scratches an itch. Created by Japanese developer Astroport and published to Windows PC back in 2010, Gigantic Army made its way to consoles as a budget price eShop game in early 2019. I'm a big fan of the lumbering mech games, like Assault Suit Lanos, and while this was a nice homage, there's a number of factors that really keep it from being a must-play. First, whatever method they use to upscale the game to HD certainly doesn't do the graphics any favors, and is frankly a bit ugly. Secondly, the audio is incredibly overmodulated and blown out for whatever reason, although you can bring the audio level down to around 25 to compensate. The graphics, however, cannot be helped. Perhaps the best eShop game released this year with no physical release in sight is Devil Engine from Protoculture Games. And you thought I was done with shooting games for this episode. This one was recommended to me by viewers on our weekly live stream, and I was completely blown away by just how good it is. Although it seems to pull from a number of influences in the shooting game genre, such as Last Resort and Gate of Thunder, Devil Engine easily bears the closest resemblance to the Thunder Force series, right down to the soundtrack. Having the guts to start out with a Space Armada level earned my respect, but following it up with a future cityscape with saxophones blazing in the soundtrack earned my full attention. Who knows, maybe this is what Thunder Force 5 could have been if Technosoft didn't switch the polygons. One thing is very clear from frame one on Devil Engine. This was a work of passion, and the sprite work, animation, and soundtrack make it feel like it was made on a much bigger budget. And can I just say that I love the total commitment to using dithering for transparencies. The main gameplay hook lets you spend one of your combo levels to absorb enemy shots if you find yourself in a bind. There's also three styles of weapons, but if I had to nitpick, it would be that each of them are a little lackluster. Not in their overall look or usefulness, but just how they tend to feel, I don't know, insubstantial. They simply don't have the impact you'd expect after how unrelenting everything else is. Still, this is hardly an issue because you won't even have time to think about it once you're in the heat of battle. Like many of the greats, Devil Engine doles out extra continues the more you play. Other tweaks include the ability to change the color of enemy bullets and darken the background graphics if you're having trouble seeing enemies and their shots. There's actually an unprecedented level of customization not usually seen in shooters here. Anyway, although you might be tempted, don't rush out to get Devil Engine just yet. Due to a complicated legal situation between Protoculture Games and the publisher, Dangan Entertainment, no current sales will support the talents who created such an awesome game. So keep an eye on Protoculture Games' Twitter account to see if the situation is resolved in the future. Which brings us to one last game that I absolutely gotta talk about. I don't know, maybe it's crazy that I feel confident in saying that this game left such an impression on me from the first time I booted it up that I'm compelled to say that it was probably my favorite game that I played all year. Tango Project, responsible for 2017's excellent Wild Guns Reloaded, returns with yet another remaster slash remake of one of their classic games. 
comprised of several key members who worked on the original, the Ninja Saviors, the Return of the Warriors is a pretty thorough update of the Ninja Warriors, or as it's called in Japan, the Ninja Warriors again. <laughs> Like Wild Guns, the SNES version has become prohibitively expensive these days, so this new version had me excited to see if it would be a total replacement for the original. An expanded playing field that is now closer to the original multi-monitor arcade original, an enhanced soundtrack, and a two-player simultaneous mode are really just the beginning. The core gameplay has also been significantly enhanced. Each character now has a bunch of new attacks at their disposal. They can be activated by holding different directions on the D-pad and pressing the attack button. This fundamentally changes how the game is played for the better. It's intuitive, fast, and fun. In addition to the original three characters, two completely new ninjas, Yaksha and Raiden, join the cast. This duo have a completely unique style, attacks, and moves, but don't feel out of place at all, even if Raiden is a hulking robot that is significantly larger than just about every enemy. They can be unlocked by beating the game a couple of times with any character. You can also unlock music from the arcade game and the SNES original. So yeah, it's safe to say that this is a complete and total improvement on the original in every way. <laughs> Although Ninja Saviors can't actually be considered to be a new game, the pure joy I got out of it this year can't be understated. I'm curious to see what Tango Project will take on next, and if it'll be as good without an older work to build upon. Still, I wish that more developers would take their approach to remaking older games. This is well worth playing if you're a longtime fan, or just looking for some arcade action to pass the time. One of the biggest surprises for me in 2019 was just how much I got out of Super Mario Maker 2. Corey and I both have similar views on user-generated content. It just doesn't interest us that much. I have a huge amount of awe and respect for the incredible creations people have put together in games like Little Big Planet or Minecraft, but usually the thing that drives me in a game is completing the challenges that the developer put there themselves. So because of this, I actually skipped the original Super Mario Maker. I knew the game was very popular, but I just didn't think that the insane levels that people were showing off online looked very fun to play. So at first, I had no real intention to buy Super Mario Maker 2 either, but it enticed me with its so-called story mode that consists of Nintendo-made levels. I actually ended up buying it on a Sunday just before our weekly live stream, thinking if I was going to get any enjoyment out of user-generated levels, it would be in a stream context with people challenging me to play various levels, maybe ones that they made themselves. <laughs> oh, checkpoint. That's appreciated. Oh gosh. Oh gosh, no. No. <laughs> just no. What is this? While cynical as I was about the whole thing, it ended up being one of the most fun streams we've ever done. And that was all it took for me to realize that Super Mario Maker, or at least the sequel, was much more than a creativity tool. It was the freshest 2D Mario game I'd played since the 90s. And even some of the more difficult levels, or at least the ones that look super difficult, are more fun than I expected and make you feel kind of awesome when you catch the flow. <laughs> ah! Ah! Oh, I gotta do this. But I actually found myself most captivated by the levels that have light puzzle solving, adventuring, and even storytelling elements. Some levels I played were just so clever that I couldn't stop grinning. I even bothered to make a few levels of my own. One should be fun for RGB Masterclass fans, and another is a time travel themed level. I've got ideas for a few others too, and I would genuinely like to take the time to make them someday. Something that I've not really felt compelled to continue doing in a creative sort of game since, I don't know, maybe Mario Paint.
Oh yeah, and the story mode. It's pretty fun too. It's good to see Nintendo's in-house level desires do things that are so much more original and compelling than what they would do with the new series. So even if you think user-generated content is not for you, give Super Mario Maker 2 a try. If the last time a 2D Mario game truly blew you away was on the Super Nintendo, I think you'll find that this is the true evolution of the 2D Mario formula that the By the Numbers new series never dared to be. I played several other 2019 releases, some of which were just okay, like Yoshi's Crafted World, which felt like a step back from the excellent Yoshi's Woolly World. Others were really good, but didn't leave a lasting impression for reasons I can't really explain, like Astral Chain. I wish I had more to say about the remake of The Legend of Zelda Link's Awakening, but I think I'll return to the Game Boy Color version for any future replays. I felt like I was open to the new art style, but after reflecting on it a bit, I feel that the original 144p presentation demands so much from your imagination that it's hard for me to then accept someone else's vision of Coholent Island. But in terms of games that actually released in 2019, the remake of Resident Evil 2 is absolutely the one that I'm considering my game of the year. The original version of RE2 is a common pick for the fan favorite, but to me it's always fell short of Resident Evil 1, the original version, or the remake in terms of atmosphere and level design. And considering that the RE1 remake is often considered the best video game remake of all time, RE2 had a lot to live up to. Well, the team was clearly up to the challenge, giving us an entirely new game that is a perfect mix of surprise and familiarity, pushing both the original design and the Resident Evil series gameplay to new heights. While it is iconic, the original game's police station never felt terribly scary to me in the original version. But modern lighting and other technical and artistic touches have transformed the Raccoon City Police Department into a truly frightening place. And zombies are scary again. If you left one roaming a tight hallway, it could be a decision that you'll come to regret, but due to tight resources, you might just have to live with it. And when Mr. X shows up, everything changes. Clearly a prototype for Nemesis in 2020's Resident Evil 3, when Mr. X is around, you're constantly listening for his booming footsteps and trying to determine the best path to the item or room you're trying to reach. The police station becomes an open playing field with many possible routes, but none of which feel completely safe. In my first run, the West Wing hallways became completely overrun with zombies, which seriously limited my options. Throughout the whole game, the genuine danger of the environments combined with the freedom that you have to explore them just makes for an incredible experience and a new high bar for the series. For me, Resident Evil 2 just shot way up on my list of favorite Resident Evil games. Well, there you have it. There are a bunch of other games that we'd have liked to have mentioned, but well, gotta draw the line somewhere. 2019 was a challenging year with a lot of big documentary projects taking up a ton of our time, but we also figured out ways to optimize our workflows, balance our lives a bit better, and make time for games and relaxation. We expect 2020 to be an extremely prolific year for My Life in Gaming, with much more regular content, including the long-awaited five-part documentary series featuring some of the retro tech community's best and brightest, and the very much overdue return of the RGB 200 series. So here's to another year of videos, tech, and of course, 
just playing some more games. You don't need us to tell you that 2020 was a year unlike any other, but it is certainly a year that we've made it to the end of and a year in which, just like any other year, we did indeed play through some number of video games, both new and old. 2020 is just one of those landmark years that we're all going to remember for the rest of our lives. And it wasn't an easy year, and I have to admit, we certainly didn't accomplish anywhere near what I thought we could going into the year. But there were some bright spots too. And among those bright spots were many of the games that we spent time with throughout the year. In terms of new releases, it was most definitely the year of the remake. But if you've watched these episodes in the past, you'll know that this isn't your typical yearly list, since we spend so much of our gaming time playing catch-up, both on games from a few years ago to a few decades ago. These are the games that we played in 2020. To say that 2020 was an odd year would be quite the understatement. It simultaneously felt like the longest and the shortest year of my life. But I'm very thankful that my family has remained fairly healthy through it all, at least physically. Juggling two kids and homeschooling with work took a toll of its own. Just before the pandemic, my family moved to a new house. And if there is one real benefit to the stay at home quarantine order is that I had a whole slew of new projects to work on. The most exciting thing for me was that I had a chance to finally put together a new studio and gaming space in my basement using all the cool tricks that I picked up since we started Emlig back in 2013. I learned a lot, from repairing drywall to running and installing new electrical receptacles. I never imagined myself as the handyman type, but it's safe to say that it's turned into a bit of a side passion of mine. But what good was doing all this setup work if I wasn't going to put everything through its paces? The quarantine also gave me ample time to play some games. Most surprising to me being that I found it much easier to commit to some longer games than I had in some time. The one game that everyone has talked about ad nauseum at this point is Final Fantasy VII Remake. Even we ourselves spent over an hour talking about it in a video, and that hour was heavily edited. Trust me, you don't want to see the unedited version. Your time would be much better served watching Tim Rogers' three plus hour long review of it. It's like they wanted this menu to be boring. On the other hand, when you look at their attempt at a fun menu, you'll kind of wish you were just using Microsoft Excel. This was a game that I wasn't nearly as excited for after I heard that it was going to be episodic. But I knew that I was going to play it day one when it finally arrived in April. <laughs> The experience as a whole was interesting and much better than I expected it to be. I cannot properly state just how gorgeous most of this game is, from the skyboxes to the main character models. If it weren't for the occasional low resolution textures, I'd say that this could be the best looking game I played all year. The soundtrack simultaneously makes familiar pieces sound brand new, while hitting you right in the nostalgia bone. The new compositions fit right in and are pretty much just as good as the stuff as you know and love. I can't get enough of Midnight Rendezvous. And that's? The underside of Sector 6, Wall Market. A real special place. But I'm sure you already knew that, right? I mean, it's so good that it makes it easier to deal with the annoying, artificially drawn out segments, like the second bombing run section. And Tifa helped a lot too. When the credits rolled after 41 hours, the last hour threatened to undo a lot of the excitement I had over the game. 
The ending was unexpected and fairly controversial in nature. I didn't like it at all. Let us defy destiny together. But I have to admit, eight months later, my view on it has softened considerably to the point where, yeah, okay, I'm interested to see where things could go, even if we have to wait who knows how long to find out. Heck, I'll probably replay it when it gets a PS5 release, as long as that apartment door in the slums has a texture that properly loads. Developed with a considerably lower budget, but with just as much love, was the Trials of Mana remake. The original SNES release was legendary as one of the most famous Super Famicom releases that never received an English localization. This remake was announced alongside the Collection of Mana Nintendo Switch release that featured the original version officially translated to English for the first time. While it was great to finally experience an official translation on the SNES version, I found it challenging to get into because of the sluggish menu navigation and disjointed battles. It never quite clicked with me in the same way that Secret of Mana did, so I never finished it. Which is why I feel that this remake is so perfectly timed. <laughs> It straight up fixes pretty much all of the issues I had with the original and makes it incredibly fun to play. I found myself going out of my way to do extra stuff just because I was enjoying myself so much. The redone musical score doesn't stray too far from the original and is lovely. And although the voice acting sure does leave a lot to be desired, it's me, Matalo, the supernatural enthusiast. It works because the story is almost line for line the same as the official translation of the original game. This is one of those instances where I feel that the remake is a full-on replacement for the original. Outside of co-op play on the SNES version, I think you can dive right in here without feeling like you're missing out on anything. The close proximity of Trials Remake to the Final Fantasy VII Remake gives us an interesting juxtaposition. One goes out of its way to completely change things from the original, while the other embraces its source and evolves to make it more playable by today's standards and not much else. The latter approach is something that I hope to see Square Enix embrace more in the future. Why would I trust my fate to something like that? All I believe in is strength, but I'll listen to what you have to say if you tell me how to become more powerful. Appearing for the third consecutive year in one of these retrospective videos is Dragon Quest XI, Echoes of an Elusive Age. Although I initially thought I was going to play the PS4 release when it came out, I never got around to it. The Switch port, the definitive edition, seemed more my speed as I've played every Dragon Quest game's almost exclusively in portable form since I got into the series with Dragon Quest IX. There's something about the familiar nature of these games that make grinding, a lot of fun, and doing it while you're easily able to do something else is not only easy, it's efficient. Going in, I wasn't aware that this game was envisioned as a celebration of the history of the Dragon Quest series, which really made it something special. I love that while each entry might add some new stuff, there's never going to be any sort of sweeping change to the base gameplay. It's a Japanese RPG series for those who grew up playing these types of games. You always know what you're gonna get. Since this was my first time playing the game, I stuck with the 3D mode almost all the way through, only dabbling in the 2D stuff when I was forced to. It still amazes me that this 2D mode is as well implemented as it is. Outside of the font used, it feels true to the spirit of the 8 and 16-bit entries. The story goes to some interesting places that I really appreciated, especially since Final Fantasy VI is one of my favorite games of all time. While I don't think the twist is handled as nearly as well as in that game, it still surprised me because I had no idea it was coming. By the time I had wrapped up the true ending, I'd invested over 101 hours into it. Sure, it was over the course of three or four months, 
but that's far more than any other game I played all year. Ah, not bad at all. I made it a point to see if all the hype surrounding the 2019 Resident Evil 2 remake lived up to my expectations. And sure enough, it's exactly as good as word of mouth would lead you to believe. Now, I played the original RE2 the day it came out, and it's probably the most memorable in the series to me. I was enthusiastic about the remake from the time it was announced, but the original was so packed with content for its time. To translate that to modern systems seemed, well, like a tall order. But not only were they able to do it, they went above and beyond in every aspect. The amount of stuff in this game is crazy, more than I'd ever do. I didn't even touch the extra DLC story segments that were unlocked after beating the game. The tweaks and expansions of the story and characters made sense, but also served to throw off people who'd played through the original countless times in the last 20 years. It's been said again and again, but Mr. X is basically the scariest thing I've ever experienced in a game. He's a constant threat, whether or not you hear his footsteps or not. He's always there in the back of your mind. Playing this game with a surround sound system is a must and takes the impending dread you're constantly saddled with to a point where it becomes mentally exhausting. Having finished the RE2 remake, I realized that the Resident Evil 3 remake was only days away. I decided that it would be fun to play that on day one. And while I was a big fan of the RE2, RE3, well, I played the Japanese PS1 version, Last Escape, about a month before the US release. And that was it. As such, I remembered very little about it outside of the fact that it never should have been a numbered entry in the series in the first place. I don't have time to explain. You gotta get out of there right now. All right, let me grab mine. I wonder if my memory being so faded on the original version heightened my enjoyment of this remake beyond the typical response I saw from longtime fans. Sure, I guess a lot was cut and changed, but I could not even begin to tell you what it was. But what I can tell you is how a lot of the stuff that worked in the RE2 remake was jettisoned in the 3 remake for whatever reason. Yes, it's a lot more of an action-focused game. I mean, so was the original. But even little gameplay tweaks, such as breakable knives, could have really gone a long way to enhance this overall experience. Perhaps the most puzzling aspect here is how badly they dropped the ball on Nemesis. I think everyone began to get excited about this remake based on how Mr. X had laid the groundwork so that old Nemi here could really ratchet up the intensity. Ugh, what a disappointment. It felt like basically every encounter with him was completely scripted and totally removed the omnipresent doom that Mr. X provided. Heck, I remember Nemesis in the original Resident Evil 3 being far more unpredictable than this. Like the original, it's better seen as a companion piece to RE2 than a full-fledged numbered sequel. It's a breezy experience, I finished it in two nights of playing. I liked it, but I wouldn't call it memorable. Just a real missed opportunity to bring new meaning to Resident Evil 3. So yeah, quite a few remakes this year, huh? And this isn't even all of them. I recently finished up the Panzer Dragoon remake on the Switch, and it was a lot better than I've been led to believe. Although, I suppose it did receive quite a bit of post-launch support to make it the best it could be. I agree with pretty much everything Corey said about all of those remakes, and he especially hit the nail on the head with the Final Fantasy VII remake. I mean, did Square Enix actually have the foresight that we'd eventually cool down on the implications of its wild ending and be sorta okay with it? I'll admit, kinda brilliant if so. But yeah, so many remakes this year, and I played a few that Corey didn't like, the Xenoblade Chronicles Definitive Edition, and the only PS5 game I bought this year, the Demon's Souls remake. 
both of which I loved, but we've probably already had enough remake talk, don't you think? So let's talk about the games of the past that we played this year. And I'm not just talking about games on classic consoles I beat this year, like Clash at Demon Head and Battle of Olympus on NES, Ninja Spirit and Valis 4 on PC Engine, the latter of which was really, really tough. Shadow Dancer on Genesis, which was not as tough as I expected. Battletoads and Battle Maniacs on Super Nintendo, which I'd been trying to beat for years. Or even my first ever beaten Game Gear game, the GG Shinobi. No, I'm talking about the games of the far-flung actual past. Because for me, 2020 was the year of the caveman cavemen are, for whatever reason, a pretty common video game hero, especially in the 80s and 90s. But they persist even today, like with Jet Cave Adventure, which I tried the demo of as a joke on a stream, but actually it seems really fun, so I'm kind of hoping for a physical copy. I gotta wonder though, does anyone actually consider themselves a fan of the stock cartoon caveman character? I mean, they aren't cool in any way, really. But I think the appeal is the cool things that happen around cavemen. You've got volcanic explosions, woolly mammoths, and of course, obviously, lots and lots of dinosaurs. I hadn't had all that much interest in the Joe and Mac games until I tried Joe and Mac 2 on the Nintendo Switch Online service. And I was really surprised by how fun and polished it is. I decided that this was a series I wanted to play through and went on to pick up the SNES cartridges. The first game was originally a Data East arcade game and was later poured to many other platforms, most famously Nintendo and Sega's 16-bit machines. The game is also known as Tatakai Genshijin and Caveman Ninja, but as great of a title as that may be, these dudes exude pretty much zero ninja vibes. Let's be honest. Joe and Mac are just cavemen, and their game is a pretty by-the-numbers arcade platformer. You throw weapons like bones, fire, and stone wheels, and pick up giant meat for heels. One thing that is nice about the SNES version is that it has a world map with checkpoints and unlockable bonus areas. While it does offer a rather high number of continues, they are not infinite, and my first couple of attempts at finishing the game were thwarted by just not having enough lives at the start of a continue to beat the final boss. But turns out, you can also re-enter any complete stage, so if you find a re-collectible 1-up in any stage, you can easily grind up your lives. I definitely went overkill with this because in the end I didn't use all that many more lives to conquer the final boss, but the cushion did provide some comfort. You might think that I then moved on to Joe and Mac 2, but in Japan that is actually Tatakai Genshijin 3. Tatakai Genshijin 2 is known in the West as Kongo's Caper, starring Kongo, a monkey that gets turned into a, a I guess a caveman monkey boy? For some reason, of all games, me playing this ended up being one of the most well-attended Sunday night streams we've done yet. Unlike Joe and Mac, which was only lightly tuned for the home console market, Congo's Caper was built as an SNES game from the ground up, but it still feels pretty arcadey overall. And similar to its predecessor, it's still nothing terribly special, but if you're like me and could live on a junk food diet of 8 and 16-bit platformers every day, it's still enjoyable and is a pretty cheap cartridge to pick up. I, I'm just like wiggling my butt and Girl Monkey is just like way into it, I guess. <laughs> what was that? <laughs> Now, I'm trying to save Joe and Mac 2, Lost in the Tropics, for some couch co-op action, and as you may know, the Year of the Caveman wasn't exactly flush with couch co-op opportunities. But before things got too crazy, I was able to do a little side-by-side in-person streaming with a game featuring another video game caveman. Okay, so in real life, Takahashi Meijin is certainly no caveman but his in-game avatar, known outside Japan as Master Higgins, totally is because he rides dinosaurs and wears no shirt. 
while I've certainly played through a whole bunch of Wonder Boy games, which Adventure Island is tangentially related to, until the year of the caveman, I actually had never beaten an Adventure Island game. I started with Adventure Island 2 Aliens in Paradise on Game Boy, which interestingly enough is a port of Adventure Island 3 on NES, while Adventure Island on Game Boy is a port of the second NES game which is just too fitting for the convoluted mess that is the Wonder Boy family tree. But yes, the one I played is 2 on Game Boy, which is based on 3 NES. I played it alongside Drumble on the Backloggery livestream, who was playing the NES game, which was, well, an interesting contrast. While the two games are broadly similar, the Game Boy version has a somewhat less hectic pace, adjusted level designs to better suit the smaller screen, and it was generally just a more mellow, but still challenging experience. Yeah! <laughs> but the real twist is that the NES game forces you to start from the beginning of a world every time you run out of lives, which can happen very often, while the Game Boy version lets you continue on the same level no matter how many times you die. Another pretty easy boss. I'm very happy for you. <laughs> Schadenfreude is not an emotion I experience very often, but I must say, it did feel very satisfying to know I was playing the much more fun version of the game. I don't have those poundy things. Yeah, I know, you don't have a lot of bad stuff. <laughs> We later went on to stream Super Adventure Island on SNES side by side, but remotely. For some reason, I've always been under the impression that this is one of the less popular Adventure Island titles, but it's worth noting that it's actually the older game than Adventure Island 3. While it is a shorter and more basic game than many of the NES titles, only 15 levels compared to the vastly more in each NES game and no special features like riding dinosaurs, I thought it was a fine enough action platformer with some fun bonus stages and a somewhat quirky Yuzo Koshiro soundtrack a good choice for a laid-back evening of classic gaming. This is Adventure Island 2! Super Adventure Island 2, meanwhile, is a radically different game which sees Master Higgins don more RPG-like armor and weapons, resulting in a game that seems to want to follow Wonder Boy into Monster World. While it is pretty decent overall, it's definitely nowhere near as good as Westone's titles. The game has a ton of artificial padding toward the end and various aspects that feel less fleshed out than they could be. Generally, it just feels like the team lacked the time and budget to build a game that matched its potential. And while I am happy to own it and had fun streaming it, it's becoming a somewhat pricey SNES card at this point, and the payoff is probably not really worth the cost. I also played PC Genjin 2, aka Bonk's Revenge, on PC Engine, but since that was on Corey's list in 2017, I'll not get too into the details on this one. But it was fun, and hey, maybe I'll continue to celebrate the year of the caveman into 2021 by playing Bonk 3. Alright, uh, Year of the Caveman. Hmm. Oh, okay. So, I'd never been one for having game-collecting goals. But, ever since I gathered up one of each of the Working Designs games a while back, I've been looking for another subcategory of games to collect. That project ended up being Black Grid Sega Genesis games. In other words, all the 16-bit titles published by Sega of America during the first several years of the Genesis' life. Which... I kind of feel is the best era of the console's lifespan. And you know what? I recently completed this goal in December of 2020, when I bought Chicky Chicky Boys off of eBay before the price climbed any further. I'm not going to talk about that game though, but rather, Toki Going Ape Spit. It was one of the last five games I needed to meet that goal, 
and I was able to add it to my collection in late September thanks to George Arthur, who runs the CD Trader in Hollywood, Florida. <laughs> Toki is just one of those games that has remained a mystery to me over the years. I played it in a Aladdin's Castle arcade at some point during my childhood, and it always stuck with me as being such a weird game. You control this guy who's been turned into a monkey that shoots balls of energy from his mouth. So I guess Toki is pretty popular and has enough of a following to not only be ported all over the place, but even completely remade on modern consoles. Seriously, I have the Switch version. It came in a big box and turns into an arcade machine. That's a lot of effort for Toki. The Genesis game isn't what you would call a port of the arcade game. It's more of a re-envisioning with the same gameplay mechanics and main characters. Subtitling it Going Ape Spit seems like a pretty bold move for 1992, but I guess it's pretty on brand with Sega's audience at that time. It just seems like a strange game to go there with, especially in conjunction with this box art. I've been thinking about it for months and it still makes me laugh. I'm willing to bet that so few kids were begging for Toki on the Sega Genesis that not a single parental eyebrow was raised over the title. If I make it sound like Toki's bad box art is the most fun thing about it, well, you're probably right. But the game is pretty okay. I mean, it's tough. It has one-hit kills that will have you gritting your teeth fairly often. But I suppose it wouldn't be that bad if your character didn't walk so freaking slow all the time. Grabbing some gym shoes does speed you up and boosts your jumping ability, but many times that's just going to lead to more cheap deaths. I was able to finish Toki during one of our live streams on easy mode, which prevents you from seeing the last level and getting a true ending. Uh, do I think I'll ever go back to it and try to get the real ending? Well, maybe if I don't have other spit, I'd rather be playing. Oh, you did it! I did it, but it says... True peace will not come until you play and defeat the harder modes. Sticking with the Sega Genesis, or rather Mega Drive in this case, we have Magical Hat no Butabi Turbo Daibuken, which translates to Magic Hat Flying Turbo Adventure. There's an exclamation mark after the word turbo in the title, so you gotta say it like you mean it. Now, this is a game that you could say lies on the periphery of the Black Grid Genesis games, because it was completely redone for English-speaking audiences as Decap Attack, starring Chuck D. Head. Magical Hat was Vic Tokai's follow-up to Psycho Fox for the Master System, and it looks and feels incredibly similar, right down to the semi-annoying momentum-based gameplay. It can be super tough to reach certain platforms or make jumps because you really need to get a running jump to make it. And I'm willing to bet that a bunch of your deaths will come from the physics in this game. Thankfully, it doles out extra lives like crazy if you know where to look. These pole vaults give you something like 10 lives each. I think the game looks great, much better than what they were changed to in Decap Attack. Although the punching animation is a little odd. The disembodied hand and arm has no real oomph to it, although I still think it might be better than Chuck D has gut-surrounded face launching forth from his midsection. I've played other notable Sega Genesis games this year, like Alicia Dragoon, which along with Toki goes for a pretty penny when it comes to Black Grid titles. I wasn't able to finish that, despite a pretty good run during a live stream though. Maybe I'll do it in 2021. Although, I said the same thing last year about Heckfire. Although I wasn't able to do that, I think I'll be able to take it down in the early portions of 2020. Well, that hasn't gone very well. But one system that I didn't play very much this year, the NES. I gotta say I'm pretty burnt out on this system and its games lately. Despite this, I spent a nice evening finishing Batman Return of the Joker, a game that I've been meaning to play for years. Although I don't feel that the gameplay is nearly as timeless as Batman the Video Game on the NES, Return of the Joker is without a doubt one of the more impressive looking games on the system. 
Huge character sprites and parallax scrolling effects show what the system was capable of six plus years into its lifespan. Try always told me that he suspects this game was not originally conceived as a Batman game, and having played through it now, I can't say I disagree. Is this the last boss? Uh, is it is it a giant is it a giant machine? With yeah, a it looks, in it? Uh, yeah, it looks like the Predator almost. I told you, right? It looks yeah. like this game started as like a Predator game. Next, I'm going to talk about two games that need absolutely no introduction. I'll keep it quick because basically everything that there is to say about them has already been said. Anyone who has owned an NES has likely played Contra. Heck, I'd say that anyone who has more of a passing interest in video games has played Contra at some point in their life. I played Contra in 1988, and in case you haven't noticed, this video is not called The Games We Played in 1988. But I'll tell you what I have never done before 2020. Beat Contra without using the 30 lives code. One could argue that I never actually played Contra until this year. And you know what? It wasn't even that hard. I think that Contra has always seemed like a game that is intimidating to play without the code, but you should have a go at it. Dip your toe in. I think you might be surprised that it's not even that tough at all. The other game is Super Mario 3. Believe it or not, although I'd finished the NES version back around when it came out, I'd never actually beaten the SNES All-Stars version. It seemed like a good choice for my first live stream from the new house and ended up being a pivotal moment for our Sunday night live streams, garnering a significantly larger audience than anything we'd done before. This particular stream, which ended up with me seeing the ending credits after nearly six hours, thanks to plenty of motivation from the viewers, enhanced my appreciation of Mario 3 to an insane degree. <laughs> Did I do it? There's, there's well, no... technically you can fly. Huh? If, if, if you wanted to die, you could make it happen. <laughs> <sighs> Crying out loud, man, that was... And now, for something completely different. Well, at least for me. Pokemon. Let me preface this by saying that I am 42 years old. By the time that Pokemon released in 1998, I was already in college. So you could say that I was pretty well outside of its blast radius by the time that it landed in the US. And as such, I've never been really able to get into any of them. But believe me, I've tried with both the Game Boy Advance and Nintendo DS. Still, I spent the earliest years of Pokemon's North American phenomenon working in retail at Electronics Boutique. So naturally, I picked up the names of several of the original 151. Anything beyond that? and you may as well be speaking another language. Just as the stay-at-home orders were starting, my kids, who are five and eight, were becoming obsessed with Pokemon. And I just found a copy of Pokemon Snap at Goodwill. At first, I set it up for my kids to try out, but they lost interest almost immediately because they couldn't wrap their heads around how the N64 controller worked. That's when I stepped in and took control. Suddenly, the whole game turned into an incredible, magical experience that no game that I play with them has been able to match since. Because Pokemon Snap is set up like a roller coaster ride, the kids had so much fun calling out every single character's name as they appeared. How is their ball doing? No, are you just, there's waterfalls. Oh, it turned into it a ditto. It was a ditto. Yeah, it, it was, was a ditto. It was ditto's a ditto trick. Are oh, coffee and Jigglypuff! It was such a perfectly timed experience where their enthusiasm for the games were at its peak, and I was not able to be completely lost because at least I know who these Pokemon were. So, it finally happened. After 20 years, I was able to find a Pokemon that I actually wanted to play. I mean, heck, I'll probably end up buying the new Pokemon Snap when it comes out on the Switch later on this year, so that we can do it all over again. Hopefully, they won't have moved on to something else completely by then.
so Corey played Dragon Quest XI this year. I played it in both 2018 and 2019. You know, I like to think that every year could be and should be the year of Dragon Quest. And one Dragon Quest game that I'd had sort of sitting partially finished on my backlog for a good while was Dragon Quest Heroes on PS4, which I picked back up this past spring. And you know, it was pretty good, but definitely flawed. Defending certain points on the map using summoned monsters was frustrating a lot of the time because your human party members always follow the character you're controlling and you can't split them up. This is something that was very much fixed in Fire Emblem Warriors with its tactical map, another game that I happened to play this year and perhaps my favorite Musou game so far, at least from a mechanical and map design standpoint. The character lineup was pretty lame. I mean, where are all my GBA era characters? That's where the Hyrule Warriors games really nail it because everyone is just really unique and fun to play as in Age of Calamity but I'm still working on that one. Fantastic fun so far. And I do look forward to playing Dragon Quest Heroes too. I mean, having put that one off until after the release of the PlayStation 5 should definitely pay off with a far smoother gameplay experience. But the Dragon Quest game that I'm most excited to talk about this year is probably the one that the fewest people watching this video will have played. And honestly, it might be more accessible than you think. better believe that I'm talking about the one mainline numbered entry in the series that to date has still received no version of any kind in English. The thing that struck me the most about Dragon Quest X after starting to play it is that, wow, this sure is Dragon Quest. You want to play an MMO? Go play Final Fantasy XIV. You want to play Dragon Quest? Come get you some Dragon Quest X. This game barely feels like an MMO and features like being able to hire offline players as AI NPCs to fill out your party makes it feel very much like a more expansive version of Dragon Quest 3 and 9's gameplay. The interface, totally classic. The towns and storylines, as Dragon Quest as they come. The battle system? Just look at this beautiful menu-driven turn-based action. I never dared dream that an MMO could get away with just being a regular old JRPG, but my word, they'd already done gone and did it. I mean, I know that Dragon Quest is all about being that consistent and reliable Japanese gaming comfort food, but I still can't get over just how perfectly Dragon Quest it all is. Wow, you say? This looks way more fun than I expected, and I'd also like to get in on the one number Dragon Quest I haven't beaten, but how can I do it? Well, first things first, you no longer need a VPN to play the game in the United States. There's no guarantee that the IP block might not be reinstated at some point, but it's been down for a pretty long time by now. However, I understand that Europe may still be blocked. I bought the PS4 all-in-one version 1 to 5 physical edition that released earlier this year, following the latest expansion in the fall of 2019. I believe getting going with the Switch version is supposed to be mostly similar, but for PS4 you'll need both a Japanese PlayStation Network account and a Japanese Square Enix account. You then register the game code on the Japanese PSN to get full access to the content and 20 days of free play. You can then pay for the subscription by simply adding yen to your Japanese PSN account from a website that delivers Japanese PSN codes via email and converting your PSN wallet money into DQX points. It's a tiny bit convoluted, but it's better than needing a Japanese credit card. However, something I might have taken advantage of had I known, you can download a demo that lets you play through, I believe, the first expansion, aka version 2, for free with some limitations such as no ability to trade with players or purchase items at the auction house and many classes being locked. But at any rate, I was able to finish the version 1 storyline by buying only one month of sub time, and that's where I've stopped for now. You can also log in during free hours, aka kids time, which seems to be 11pm to 1am eastern time on the weekends, but are way into the middle of the night on weekdays. And I do recommend the PS4 version, by the way, because the PS4 Pro support is shockingly excellent. I wasn't expecting much because Final Fantasy XIV's Pro support is pretty weak. And while many HUD elements like text are 
fairly low res, I mean, this was originally a Wii game, you know, the 3D graphics are crispy 4K and the frame rate is a pretty smooth 60, except in the busier towns, which I think PS5 should smooth over nicely when I continue playing. And when played on non-Japanese system, at least, confirm is X and cancel is circle, just like we're used to over here. But no matter which version you choose, everyone plays on the same servers together. For instance, I was playing with my friend Lindus of the Backloggery, who has the PC version and generously translated the main story as we played through it together. But for everything else, I was on my own. And if you can't read Japanese, it might seem impossible to play, but you know, the Google Translate app on your phone with the camera function can give you a decent enough idea of what people are saying. And you can get by with learning where key functions in the menu are. Sorting through combat skills is not easy, and I'll admit, so far I've mostly just stuck to spamming a few things that seem effective, but the early game is not all that tough and I'm having fun anyway. The game actually finally kicked me towards starting to learn some kanji and Japanese vocab with Wani Kani, which has actually been kind of fun so far. And maybe I'll understand a tiny bit more on my own by the time I subscribe again to take on version 2. And hopefully still more by the time we finish everything. You know, considering all of these barriers to play, it might seem like a strange choice, but I've found myself so charmed by Dragon Quest X's dedication to its roots in spite of its status as an MMO, that I've just got to give it the award of best new to me game that didn't actually release in 2020. <laughs> So back when I was preparing to make the modern and retro gaming on 4K TVs episode in 2018, I was trying to bolster my library with more games that supported HDR and resolutions above 1080p. So when I grabbed the new God of War reboot, I promised myself that I'd really make that $60 count by actually playing through it as soon as I finished the episode. Well, I got sidetracked and played a bunch of Final Fantasy XIV instead. And for whatever reason, I didn't get around to properly starting the game until this past year. Playing God of War this past October with the impending release of next-gen consoles and their solid-state storage on my mind perhaps put the game in a bit of a different perspective compared to if I had actually played it in 2018. The game's big conceit, as you may know, is that it is one continuous shot from beginning to end. There is never a camera cut from gameplay to cutscene or to Ooh. different angles within a cutscene, which is a super cool idea. What are you doing? Now its guard is up. But to pull it off, Sony Santa Monica had to very carefully design this interconnected world around the limitations of the PS4 storage and memory. And at times it can be very obvious that a room, a door, a corridor, a boat, a passage you must squeeze slowly through, a heavy obstacle you must lift, even many conversations. I just felt constantly aware that all sorts of beats in the game exist primarily to mask the challenge of fulfilling this goal of a completely seamless game with a high level of graphical fidelity. And as a result, it's more plotting moments, like shifting between the realms of Norse mythology, are essentially loading screens baked into the game's design. And I suspect that this may ultimately make the game seem a bit dated ahead of its time. I can't help but think it all feels like an amusement park ride or a cheap magic show where you know the illusion would be broken if only you could just see what was happening on the other side of an arbitrary wall. I'm already imagining the PS5 God of War sequel granting you an item that allows for instant travel between the Nine Realms and much snappier design that isn't gated by so many doors and closed rooms. That said, this game is absolutely the reinvention that the God of War series needed. I think just about everyone was feeling pretty done with the original gameplay style and the series never topped God of War 2 anyway. I need no protection. Do not forget that it was I who made you a god, Ghost of Sparta. I myself never cared for Kratos as a character, but what I loved about the series anyway was the spectacle that happened around him. And as impressive looking as it is, I'm not sure if the new God of War ever quite matches the architectural beauty of the original series' massive Greek temples. God of War was the ultimate wild ride through Greek mythology, making it every bit as bombastic and horrible as the myths themselves. 
I think there is potential for sequels to this game achieving the same status for me with Norse mythology, although this one most definitely has its moments. I think you got him. As for the gameplay, I do think it's good, but it didn't click with me as much as I expected it to. While I do like the over-the-shoulder perspective, I'd have preferred a slightly wider field of view, and surprisingly enough, I might have actually missed the old fixed angles more than I thought I would have. The throwing and magical retrieval of the Leviathan Axe is a fantastic core combat idea, but I never felt as skilled in battle as I wanted to be. There are a lot of fantastic systems going on here with some neat RPG elements, but I don't know, everything here is good, but I just didn't fall in love. No specific reason why, I just didn't. Which I guess goes along with my general feelings on the game as a whole. I certainly enjoyed it, but it feels like the next game is really going to be the main event, especially considering the story leaves me with more questions than answers, and I'm very excited to see how the PS5 hardware will allow for more interesting level design, faster traversal, and bigger spectacle. I streamed Crash Bandicoot 2, and it made me realize there are a ton of iconic PS1 and PS2 series that I haven't really played beyond their first entry. So I wondered, could I turn it into the year of first Sony sequels? I went on to play through Ape Escape 2 on PS2, which is pretty much a textbook example of more of the same. That's not necessarily a bad thing considering how much I loved the first one in 2019, but that game was also wildly creative, so there was some disappointment in seeing so many gadgets and other ideas recycled for the sequel, rather than doing more new things. I also played through Spyro 2, starting it on stream with the new PS1 digital HDMI mod with creators Dan and Kristoff on Discord. But I ended up not liking Spyro 2 nearly as much as the first game, in part due to an annoying quirk where you often have to re-complete a level's main objective if you later return to collect more items. But, you know, had I known to watch out for that early on and not left a level before I felt done with it, I probably would have liked it a lot more. And you know, it might have even been the year of Insomniac, because not only did I play Spyro 2, but also Ratchet Deadlocked, and Corey played a certain other brand new Insomniac game, but I also randomly ended up going back to the awkward year of 2013. You know, the year between generations in which we actually started MLEG and played one of Insomniac's more forgotten titles. One that was sent my way a few years ago by Tony Mora, who worked on several Insomniac titles around that time and helped us out with the RGB 200 GameCube episode. Fuse is very much a game of its time, an online co-op cover shooter, and even Insomniac has admitted that their signature flair was largely sucked out of the game through focus testing. The data log's been redacted, but its first entry is dated 1947. Hey, what did I just say? I don't care if they got Walt Disney's head in there. It's none of our business. Nuke it and let's bug out. Fuse is a video game that just says VIDEO GAMES as loudly as possible. It's so emblematic of what the general public thinks a video game is that it would be a great stand-in for a fake video game that you'd see played in some random scene in a movie, except it's a real video game. And I don't mean this to disparage Fuse, because Insomniac does not make bad video games, even when they sometimes do things that don't fit with what you'd expect from them. But it does explain the tepid reception that the game received upon release. Nonetheless, Insomniac is perhaps most famous for developing weapons with some entertaining outside-the-box functionality. And each of the four characters has their own unique fuse weapon that allows for neat stuff like causing singularity chain reactions across enemies shot within a close proximity. The game almost never lets up. There's like constant action. And even though it's pretty one note and has a pretty throwaway plot, I never really felt bored through its short playtime. I don't know, maybe it helps that I don't really play games like this all that often these days. And it is interesting to recall how Insomniac followed this up with Sunset Overdrive, a game with much more Insomniac flavor that also happens to revolve around a strange orange substance. 
So even though you're not likely to play through Fuse and co-op these days like it was designed to be, and it tastes more like microwaved Insomniac than their freshest dishes, I think fans of the developer could still find it to be worth their time. I always like to make a habit of playing season-appropriate games in October, such as Silent Hill 3 this past year, which was, you know, pretty good, but the PS1 original is still my favorite. But another October game I played this year has a really interesting idea that I'd like to see more games try. I learned of Mystic Bell a few years ago when I had the opportunity to make some trailers for Way Forward. Mystic Bell isn't a way forward original, but it was developed almost entirely by Andrew Batto, who has worked on many way forward games, and they helped port and publish the console version. While it may look like just another unremarkable Metroidvania with some nice pixel art, it's actually much closer to a classic adventure game, where instead of a point and click mouse interface, you navigate the world by jumping and shooting at enemies. You collect various items throughout the castle grounds and nearby woods, many of which are just red herrings, and use your head to think about what to do with them, what you might have to combine with them, and what their ultimate purpose might be. It's classic adventure gaming stuff through and through, but I have to admit, I'm not always in the mood for pointing and clicking. So I love this concept of putting these ideas at the game's center while wrapping it up in a neat platforming package that looks nothing like what it really is. It's not like the most amazing game ever or anything. The boss battles in particular play out rather haphazardly, but it's a charming little game driven by a blend of unlikely genres, and I would be all about seeing more adventure games trying something like this. One of the most surprising aspects of the past seven or so years has been the amount of love shown towards the Wonder Boy series. From the Pitch Perfect Wonder Boy 3 remake to Monster Boy and the Cursed Kingdom, which was both Try and I's favorite game of 2018. It's been nice to be here for the rise of the Wonder Boy-like. While most of these games have been all about gorgeous hand-drawn artwork, it was Agalos a little game from Storybird Games and Wonder Boy Bobby, which takes inspiration from the Master System world of games that had me fully enamored this year. I grabbed the physical Switch release after seeing it listed for about 16 bucks on Amazon in early February. Little did I know that it would quickly shoot up in price by the time I got around to playing it. I guess the PS4 version is more casually affordable though. The graphics, style, and gameplay are a perfect encapsulation of its influences. I love the natural evolution of your moveset by the end of the game, and the music is absolutely fantastic. I gotta say, it was nice to play a game that was influenced by the Master System instead of the NES. It does a really great job of recreating that feeling for me, but it's unfortunate how ugly the uneven scaling of the pixel art is. There's loads of shimmering here. And then, we have Blazing Chrome from Joy Masher, which harkens back to Contra Hardcore on the Genesis. Blazing Chrome. Chrome was in the works for a number of years, and I had my eye on it from the first trailer. The wait was well worth it. I can't think of another game that so accurately nails the grungy look of many late generation Sega Genesis games. If I didn't know any better, I think I could be convinced that this was actually running on the console. Each level is a pitch-perfect combo of run-and-gun action, vehicle combat, and giant bosses. If you're a Contra fan and haven't played it yet, I don't know what you're thinking. This is the real Contra Rogue Corps, and Konami should be approaching game designer Danilo Diaz and the team at Joy Masher with stacks of cash to bring the series back to its former glory. One of, if not the biggest surprise of the year for me, belongs to none other than Streets of Rage 4. From the time that the game was first revealed, I was down on it. Lizard Cube's art style was amazingly appropriate for the Wonder Boy 3 remake and complemented that world spectacularly. But you know what, for Streets of Rage 4, I straight up hated it. <laughs> 
and felt it was not how I ever wanted a Streets of Rage revival to go. I'm not ashamed to admit that I was totally wrong once the game released and I played it. SOR 4 captures the spirit of what made the original so good while evolving the gameplay just enough to make it interesting. There's plenty of homages here to the original games that will make longtime fans feel right at home. But I just need to say it. With some months to reflect on it, I'm still not sure if the overall style was the right way to go. Yes, it's animated gorgeously. It looks great. And I have no problem with the character designs themselves. But I can't help but feel that it's just not right for this game in particular. I'm not going to sit here and say that I know what would be right either. If an eventual part 5 does materialize, I'd like to see if they could change up the style again and see what they come up with. Also, being a Streets of Rage game, it's necessary for me to comment on the soundtrack. As someone who prefers the music of Streets of Rage 1 over that of 2 and 3, well, the only song in the soundtrack here that really gets me hyped up is the synthwave beats of Rising Up that plays during the requisite elevator level. I think more of this flavor of music throughout would have really elevated the soundtrack significantly for me. Then, there's some games that didn't quite click with me the way that I thought that they would. Among that relatively small group was 2016's reboot of Doom. Now, before you go crazy, I am well aware just how good this game is. I really enjoyed playing it for the first couple of nights, and it was nice to play an FPS that wasn't concerned with complex mission objectives and managing ammunition. I think it was just a bit too drawn out for me, and after the initial adrenaline rush of the action wore off, it started to feel really repetitive and, well, boring for me. Kirby sputtered onto the Switch in the most disappointing way with Kirby Star Allies. I'll admit to being a fair-weather Kirby fan. I didn't really become hooked on the character until Return to Dreamland on the Wii, which remains my favorite entry in the series. I was definitely hyped to getting around to playing Star Allies, even though I'd heard that the switch to 30 frames per second was a bit of a disappointment. I didn't think I'd care or notice all that much, but once I finally got around to playing it, yeah, the lower frame rate was jarring and I was shocked just how much of an effect it had on my initial impression. It just looks bad especially when the graphics don't really seem to be pushing the system in any meaningful way to justify it. What floored me the most was just how slow and boring this game is. It's definitely the worst of the new Kirby games. The big hook is the Allies system, where you can have up to three different enemies join you with their different powers. It just ends up being more annoying than fun. The way it translated to multiplayer, at least for my kids, caused more arguments than anything else. At least with single player, you can go solo with Kirby and just play it traditionally if you wanted. Considering the RPGs that I played this year, I was puzzled that Z-Boyd Games' Cosmic Star Heroine didn't quite gel with me at all. There's nothing here that's far outside my wheelhouse. Its central inspirations are Fantasy Star and Chrono Trigger. I mean, those are both games that I love, but I just couldn't get into it and shelved it after seven or eight hours. I think that I'll be giving it another chance down the line when I feel like it. I mean, it's certainly not bad, it was just bad timing for me. But perhaps the most shocking, well, if you told me last year that I would play a mere fraction of Fantasy Star Online 2 than I thought that I would, I would have said that you were crazy. But after the first couple of weeks, I missed a single day of logging in, which turned into two, and three, and then eventually months. So, I'm not quite sure what happened. I'd been looking forward to PSO2 for nearly eight years. When I had a chance to play the game, I loved it. It's incredibly fun to play. The action is fast, and it looks really good considering its age. But maybe there is just so much content ready to go 
that everything moved so fast that it quickly became overwhelming. If you didn't keep up with it, you'd feel like you'd never catch up. Maybe one day I'll return to it on the Xbox Series X and give it a more dedicated go. Change over. Speaking of next gen, the release of new consoles this year was not something that I was really looking forward to at all. I honestly kind of felt like it was a bad year to do it with everything going on in the world, but also because I didn't think that most games would even be ready. Uh, I didn't pre-order any console, but I was able to get a PlayStation 5 at launch thanks to my friend Jeff. My loan purchase for the system was Spider-Man Miles Morales. I went into my ups and downs with Marvel's Spider-Man in last year's video. You know, how I was ambivalent about it until I saw Into the Spider-Verse, and that sparked my interest in the character again. Well, I remember being very surprised to see Miles Morales appear in the PS4 game, and even that he gained power so quickly. So when Spider-Man Miles Morales was announced as a launch title for the PS5, I was definitely going to buy it, because it was the only thing that I was really interested in. No, it's not nearly as content dense as the first Spider-Man game, but as a side game, it's pretty amazing just how much is in here. I really appreciated the faster moving, more condensed story, and I always love a wintertime setting. I lived in New York City for 12 years, so moving through this recreation of the city is still fun. The Venom super moves add just enough to your repertoire that combat never feels exactly the same. I played on performance mode. But the recent addition of the Performance RT setting will certainly have me revisiting it to see what the whole ray tracing thing is all about. But more than anything, I'm curious to see what'll happen in the next full Spider-Man game. They just can't reuse this city again. They're gonna have to really increase the size, perhaps to another burrow. I'm not a Demon Souls fan, so I skipped out on that one. But looking at the overall launch lineup of the PlayStation 5, I think most who bought the system at launch were likely most taken by Astro's Playroom than anything else. We both gushed about Astrobot's rescue mission on the PSVR a couple years ago, calling it a Mario 64 moment. Playroom isn't quite that type of revelation, but it is absolutely incredible. A big part of that is its simplicity. Yes, the game is meant to show off the new DualSense controller, which is incredible by the way, but how it's wrapped up within the type of 3D platformer we don't even see all that often anymore makes for a super comfy time. It's level based with some general non-permanent power-ups. but the entire experience is so focused and breezy that you'll have a hard time not going back for the Platinum Trophy. The way it's served up as a celebration of PlayStation history is the icing on top, and drives home just how big of a part of gaming history Sony has become. Including this as a pack-in with all PS5 systems is a stroke of brilliance, and will probably revive some feelings of a simpler time that a lot of gamers have probably forgotten about. So this year I ended up discovering, kind of on accident really, that I actually might really enjoy playing two or more games in a series back to back. It started with Rise of the Tomb Raider, which actually really disappointed me. It just kind of felt like a very throwaway adventure, and to be blunt, it's concrete gulags and grey mountains make for one of the most visually uninteresting games I've played in recent memory. It played well enough, but it just didn't achieve high marks for me anywhere else. But it kind of made me wonder, how much of a leap forward is Shadow of the Tomb Raider? So I popped it in right after beating Rise and wow. From the get go, it's clear that IDOS Montreal has a far better eye for art direction than Crystal Dynamics. I was immediately hooked and was just like, well, guess I'm playing this now. And I liked it a lot more than Corey did when he played it in 2018. One of my overall favorites I played this year, to be honest. 
but I think a big part of why I enjoyed it so much is that I felt comfortable playing the game from the first minute. Having just finished Rise, I didn't have to relearn the controls, and it just felt great to keep my momentum with the series going. So I've decided that this is something I want to do a lot more often, because even though conventional wisdom suggests it'd be better to spread them out, I think it might actually increase my enjoyment. So I decided to try this again, although in reverse order, with another pair of games. Mario's history with RPGs has been a weird one. I mean, the original Super Mario RPG is one of the most important games in my personal gaming history, and while I liked Paper Mario on N64, it's always been hard for me to separate it from the stigma of it being not Mario RPG 2. Then there's the Mario and Luigi series, which I played the first three entries of before accepting that I just wasn't particularly having much fun with them. Paper Mario Thousand Year Door on GameCube is phenomenal though, a true highlight among the GameCube's entire library, but then the series took some weird turns. Super Paper Mario seemed like a good idea on paper, but then I just felt like it was tedious and neither good enough as an RPG or as a platformer to really make the blend work. Sticker Star on 3DS had some good ideas, but lacked any incentive to engage in battles and had this horrible situation where you could enter boss battles without a required item, with no prior hint as to what that might be, forcing you to just either die or exit the game. I felt the series had devolved to this point where it was making jokes about its own bad game design and expecting you to laugh. So when I heard that Color Splash on Wii U was better than Sticker Star, but still more of the same, I was slow to pick it up and ultimately didn't. But I decided that it was time to give Paper Mario another chance with the Origami King on Nintendo Switch, which was released only about two months after its announcement trailer. And I'm glad I did. This is a triumphant return to form, by far the best Mario RPG since Thousand Year Door, and one of my favorite games I played in 2020. The key that makes Origami King work so well for me is the overarching structure. It feels like a grand adventure again. A quest to follow five colored streamers that have wrapped up Peach's castle to their origin point and opened the way inside. But what makes it so enjoyable is that while the overall game is somewhat linear, each segment quite often becomes non-linear within itself. And while you do have your token sprite assistant character in Olivia, she doesn't force information down your throat to a point where you feel you've lost the freedom to discover things for yourself. And there are genuine mysteries to solve here. How to get inside the castle in the Shogun theme park. How to activate an ancient desert temple and much more. You're set loose in areas like these with little idea of what to do or how to proceed, but you're free to pick up the clues in your own order and slowly figure out what you must do and what it's all pointing toward. There's even one lengthy portion that takes you to the scattered islands of the Great Sea. No joke, it's actually called the Great Sea. And the sense of discovery is simply wonderful because you have no idea what you're looking for. You just know the origin of the purple streamer is out there somewhere. And the way that everything pieces together as you set out to chart the ocean in your own way makes for a special experience that can seem so rare in games these days. Okay, now the battle system, I could see that being a bit more divisive, but it mostly works for me. The big hook is that it's a sort of puzzle RPG blend where you rotate and slide the segments of a series of rings to create perfect lineups of enemies that can easily be either jumped down in a straight line or pounded in a cluster with your hammer. An ideal lineup increases your attack power, and you can choose to further ensure that the enemy won't get a chance to fight back by using higher grade boots and hammers, although they do have durability, so you'll need to keep a healthy stock of items. As the game goes on, lining up the enemies successfully within the allotted time and number of moves becomes much more challenging. But you get like a lot of money throughout the game. And frankly, the main purpose of it is to bribe toads in the audience to solve a step or two of the puzzle for you. So if you aren't feeling that into the puzzle aspect, you can always fall back on this. 
And ultimately, the only real reward for winning battles is money. No experience, yet again. And overall, I might have preferred something a little more traditional for the battle system, but it's definitely a lot better than Sticker Star, where nearly every battle is a waste of resources that you walk away from worse than you went into it. But ultimately, the Origami King is a much needed course correction for Paper Mario, and I'm optimistic about Mario's RPG future for the first time in years. It was absolutely a contender for my game of the year, and while it may have just barely not won it, I will say that while Final Fantasy VII Remake kinda gets the best soundtrack of the year by default, Origami King has one heck of a groovy soundtrack. The best Mario RPG soundtrack since the 1996 Yoko Shimomura original, yes! and it is my favorite soundtrack of the year that isn't, you know, largely composed of remixes from 90s classics. But you know, why stop there, I figured. Let's grab Paper Mario Color Splash for cheap on eBay, but not for quite as cheap as the guy who's flipping it found it on clearance at Walmart. Like with Shadow of the Tomb Raider, I do think continuing on from a related game made it easier for me to get into Color Splash than it otherwise might have been. Yes, I went in knowing full well that this would be a far inferior game. It takes mostly after Sticker Star after all. But I was still feeling high on good Paper Mario vibes, so it helped me get over the initial hump. And it does share a lot of Sticker Star's flaws, but it gives you much more incentive to fight battles, like experience to extend your maximum paint, and generally the inventory situation isn't as dire as it often was in Sticker Star. There's a shady toad who informs you as to whether your next steps in the story will require anything that, like Sticker Star, there are otherwise no guardrails against preventing you from finding yourself in an unwinnable situation. But at least he's there. The level-based design just simply does not work as well as the more open nature of, you know, Origami King or a Thousand Year Door or whatever, but I guess it doesn't ruin the game or anything. And of course, any game that utilizes the Koopalings gets automatic bonus points in my book. They were a pleasant surprise, but I sure wish they played bigger roles than simply being the who's it gonna be this time boss of every chapter. But I mean, it's fine. The game is fine. It has plenty of moments for sure. It's a decent fixing of what ailed the previous game, but it's still married to ideas that not many people seem to like in the first place but it was worth it to me to just be caught up on the Paper Mario games. And no, I'm not counting Paper Jam because that's a Mario and Luigi game. But hey, never say never. Maybe I'll find it in me to catch up on those someday too. Okay, well, I guess I've made a lot of titles for the year based on related groupings of games that I happen to play, but now I've got to declare my actual game of the year. And you know, maybe this choice makes you groan a bit. It actually kind of makes me groan a bit. But I can't deny it, this is a game that has truly earned the title of Game of the Year because it has somehow remained a game that I've actually continued to play throughout the entire year, making this truly the year of Animal Crossing. I've always enjoyed Animal Crossing well enough, but I've certainly never been one of the series' hardcore fans. I've played every entry at least up through paying off the biggest house, which, you know, takes like a month or two, I guess but then I would inevitably pretty much stop playing. Maybe check in to see the New Year's event or something, but be depressed to see the state of the town, worry that loading the save might trigger a villager to move out, and decide that it's just best to never play again. And after every Animal Crossing, I always say that it has to do something really new next time to get me to buy it again. And it never does, but I'll buy it anyway.
And I'm not sure if I could say that Animal Crossing New Horizons is really something all that new either. But whether it was because of the huge increase in the ability to decorate and customize the town outdoors, or the comforting familiarity of it all during the year that perhaps most desperately needed a game like Animal Crossing. The latest release in the series has grabbed me and compelled me to stick with it like no Animal Crossing ever has. It's by far the most time I've put into any Switch game to date, and even that playtime seems pitifully small compared to a lot of my friends. Looking at you, Game Dave and 8-Bit Duke. After a few weeks with the game, I got super into building a really organized town layout. I realized that I liked having all of my villagers packed nearby in the southeastern corner of the island, and I spent a lot of money moving houses, the shop, and the museum multiple times to build neat rows of houses and streets, making it all work as a nice town center so that nothing is ever too far away or difficult to remember how to get to, and so that the rest of the town could feel a bit more naturey and it's all continued to evolve slowly from there. In fact, I kind of made it a point to not go too overboard with the new terraforming feature so that I could maintain the original character of my island. I've got an orchard and picnic area in the southwest, the campground in the northwest, complete with amenities like an outhouse, golden toilet, squat toilet, and even a bidet, the first elevation tier in the center of the island is mostly a nature trail and wildflower meadow. And the highest elevation in the far north of the island is mostly left as is, a place for fishing and stargazing. As for my own house, I have a YouTube studio on the first floor, complete with a rear-facing HDTV so I can get shots of plugging composite video into the RCA ports, which the Happy Room Academy routinely calls me out on, but what do they know? I've got a home theater in the rear, a pretty basic bedroom to the west, an arcade under the sea to the east, and uh, keep the umbrella lab in the basement a secret, would ya? Oh yeah, and the attic is kinda spooky. I, I try to not think about it. But anyway, I think I've done a pretty darn good job. It might not be the most incredible town ever or anything, but I have to say, this is by far the most compelled I've ever been by a town building sim or whatever you might want to think of this game as. And not to judge or anything, but I've never time traveled once, and I think that's a big part of what's kept me engaged. Taking it slowly, not getting too involved with turnips more than a couple of times, and just living life on the island for a little bit, once or twice or so a week. It's never stressful, except maybe when trying to catch bugs and fish before certain ones leave every month. I did miss a few seasonal fish, but you know what? That's okay. I'll have more opportunities. Because I do see myself continuing into 2021 and beyond the game's one year anniversary in March something I no longer believed I would ever do with any Animal Crossing. It's truly been the feel-good event of the year, and maybe for more years to come. You know, I didn't actually expect Animal Crossing to win Game of the Year at the actual Game Awards event, but I absolutely would have loved to have seen Christopher Nolan, of all people, have to utter the words, Animal Crossing New Horizons, what with it being the least narratively driven nominee. But surprising no one, the semi-official Game of the Year went to The Last of Us Part Two, And even though it wasn't my own pick, I certainly wouldn't argue against it. The Last of Us Part Two is one heck of a roller coaster. While I was initially a bit bored with the large quasi open world segment that you reach in the relatively early hours of the game, luckily that part is a bit of an anomaly and soon enough resumes with a more linear structure with Naughty Dog signature freeform combat encounters, along with plenty of side paths for resource gathering. This is more like what I was looking for. And from that point onward, I was on the edge of my seat wondering what was going to happen next for a total of 33 hours. Yes, this is one long game, especially for the genre, but I think its length is also crucial to how hard it hits. You become familiar and comfortable with the characters, even at times when you feel like you don't want to be. 
And on the flip side, you become distant from the same characters when so much time passes without seeing them or playing as them. I love a story that lets you see two sides of the same events, and you might be surprised by how you flip back and forth over who you're rooting for. In a brutal world where nearly everyone has crossed too many lines, some characters eventually could say enough is enough, while others just can't stop themselves from going too far. I don't think a game has ever left me feeling so shell-shocked. And it's a story that I don't think could have been told nearly so effectively without a long runtime to get you totally immersed and invested in it. What happens may not be what anyone wanted to happen, but The Last of Us isn't exactly about handing out happy feelings. With the exception of its wonderful flashback sequences that detail how Joel and Ellie's lives were going over the years between the first and second games. Ugh, oh, I suck. Just need to build up your calluses, that's all. Man. Yeah, The Last of Us was certainly a roller coaster. From its shocking first hour through some intensely graphic and uncomfortable violence to a final showdown where I simply did not want to press the button prompts to do what the game was making me do. I don't follow any sort of gaming news for things that I know I'm going to play. So I was able to make it through an insane minefield of leaks and spoilers months ahead of release date. I'll be honest, when the big story flip first occurred, I didn't see it coming and my heart sank. I can't think of a single sequel where a switch in perspective enhanced the overall experience for me. Halo 2, Metal Gear Solid 2, both of these remain among my least favorite of their respective series. So I suppose the big difference here is that this, this is a long game. The first half is nearly as long as the original so you don't exactly feel like the character you're hoping to control is getting shortchanged. Although I feel that perhaps the total runtime of part two is a bit too long for my tastes. This was necessary to achieve what it set out to do. My initial annoyance gave way to curiosity and then ultimately empathy. It's sort of brilliant. You're forced to walk in the shoes of someone that you hate and your feelings, no matter how steadfast they seem when you first tie those laces, will likely be changed in some way by the end. Story aside, I think it's important to touch on the evolution of gameplay since the original. If you thought the original was intense and dynamic, well, whew, crawling through high grass will have you holding your own breath while the sound of an unsuspecting victim choking on their own blood as their still living friends call out their name will make you feel like you've been run through the ringer after every single encounter. <laughs> It's certainly impressive stuff, but this is not the kind of journey that I think I'm ever going to take again. One time was plenty. After I finished with Spider-Man Miles Morales and Astro Bot's Playroom, I started to think about what else I could play on my new console. Specifically, was there anything that I owned that would really see the benefit of the PS5's backwards compatibility? My mind jumped to 2017's Near Automata, a game that I played through to the first ending a couple of years back, but I didn't really feel compelled to see what else the game had to offer for whatever reason. This is command. Your hunt squadron, come in. To be here. All units have penetrated the stratosphere. Autopilot systems green across the board. Sometimes you're just not in the mood for it. No matter how good a game is, sometimes you just don't have the right mindset for it. An important lesson, and one that I should heed more often. Even though I loved Nier on the PS3, I was puzzled how much I couldn't get into Nier Automata during my first attempt at it back in 2017. 13 hours to reach the game's first ending, and I shelved it, calling it a disappointment. I think I really decided to give Nier another shot because my friend Joey planted the seed in the back of my mind as he was raving about it. The PS5 presented the perfect opportunity to reassess with a fresh attitude. Automata continually defies expectations, starting off as a shooter before transforming into the sort of third-person action game that Platinum excels at. Dodge mechanics and all. Uh. 
I resolved to fully take in the world and the story as best as I could. Just really experience it by doing as much side content as I could muster. Not just rushing from main mission to main mission like my first go around. Like its predecessor, there's a melancholy to the world and those who inhabit it that resonate with me. Don't do what I did and call it done after the credits roll for the first time. The music complements the emotions that the story drudges up, making them bubble over in a way that few have done before. And when you're all done, do yourself a favor and dive into the Yokoverse to see the insane way that the story connects to the Drakengard games, our real world, and 9,000 years of events in between. Looking back at the games that I played during the year, there's one in particular that stuck with me, even though I likely played it less than anything else in this entire video. Trust me, when I settled on this as my pick, I was just as surprised as you probably are. Sayonara Wild Hearts was originally pitched to me during one of our Sunday live streams as a video game pop album. I'm not sure how exactly it came up, but I'm fairly sure I was probably talking about Child of Eden and how I preferred his music over Rez's trance music. But that's besides the point. I saw the game available at Best Buy, so I decided to give it a shot. Sight Unseen, based on that particular recommendation. On May 5th, after the kids had gone to bed, I turned on the lights turned on the stereo, and booted up the game for the first time. From the moment that Daniel Olsen's soundtrack kicked in on the title screen, I already loved this, and it hadn't even really begun yet. What follows is a relatively simple rhythmic action game that is so tightly paced and frantic that the entire experience only lasts a little bit over an hour or roughly the length of your typical album. The gameplay genres switch from song to song, and sometimes within each song. Driving, rail shooting, 3D mazes, quick time events. For such a short game, there's a lot to take in. The songs with lyrics, sung by Linnea Olsen, are the set pieces to a story shown in glowing pastel flat shaded graphics. Wild Hearts began life as a mobile game, but it deserves to be played on a big screen with the volume turned way up. While the story is deeply rooted in arcana and tarot cards, I chose not to delve too much into that side of it. Instead, as all good music should encourage you to do, I built my own interpretation. That of a person going through different relationships, challenges, and experiences in life as they discover the person that they want to be, comfortable in their own skin. I continue to listen to the soundtrack outside of the game pretty regularly throughout the year. It connected with me, and I felt changed by it in some small way. It was just the right game at the right time. If I'd played it any other time, it's hard to say if I would have felt the same. But set against the backdrop of this year, it gave me a sense of hope that things will be okay. And so closes another year. 2020 will undoubtedly be remembered as one of the most stressful years of many people's lives. Video games have provided a small escape from reality, and we're thankful to the many people who have contributed to making these games, both new and old, who have helped us get through it. We want to extend a huge thank you to everyone who has watched My Life in Gaming for the past seven years. And rest assured, we'll continue to provide entertainment in the best way that we can into 2021.
As we draw the curtain on yet another year, we can sit back and let out a sigh of relief. The shadow of 2020 loom long, and maybe some never even opened the curtain in the first place. So perhaps some of you might find it comforting that here we are again, bloated from too many holiday cookies and sweets, looking back at the games that we played over the past year, from brand new experiences to old favorites. This little snapshot of where we are in our lives in gaming is something that we always look forward to sharing with both new and old viewers alike. And this year is no different. So let's jump in to the games that we played in 2021. This marks the 12th and obviously final fully produced episode of My Life in Gaming for the year that was 2021. It was a slow climb up to 200,000 subscribers for a while there, but I feel like we really got our grooves back at the tail end of the year. So I'm optimistic that we can carry that energy into 2022 with the Mr. episode, the final two episodes of Analog Frontiers, and just doing more fun stuff because we feel like it, like I did with the Super Scope episode. And well, speaking of which, putting together that one involved knocking four games off my backlog, but they were far from the only ones. So if you're a regular, you might know that our year-end episodes are called the games we played and not game of the year for a reason. Most of these weren't even released in 2021, and there are some disappointments alongside the ones we truly loved. So, with that in mind, let's start with the games I beat for Sega consoles this past year. The first video game I beat in 2021 was eSWAT for the Sega Genesis. eSWAT. I played this simultaneously with Drumble on the Backloggery live streams for a couple of weeks of us both trying to beat it, and we both had a similar experience of thinking the game was kinda awesome at first, then getting worried that it was unfairly difficult, hitting walls that seemed insurmountable, <gasps> I did it! and then actually having a major breakthrough at those walls on the very next run. It was a very satisfying back and forth of feeling challenged, but not being stuck for overly long. So it is an exceptionally fulfilling game to learn your way through if you're willing to try, try again. Mission completed. Conversely, one of the last games I beat in 2021 was the Sega Genesis version of Ghouls and Ghosts. I remember Drumble not being a huge fan of this one when he played it a few years ago, but it's possibly Corey's favorite Genesis game. So we played it as a side-by-side -side comparison stream against the emulated arcade version. And you know, even though I did have fun working through eSWAT from the beginning again and again, I'll admit it's a nice reprieve to play a Genesis game with infinite continues. That's kind of a rarity on the system, but it is a staple of the Ghouls and Ghosts series console versions. And this game does impress the heck out of me as a standout arcade port for so early in the Genesis' life. And while I don't think it holds a particularly special place in my heart or anything, I most certainly did enjoy it. I'm hardly the most hardcore Pokemon fan out there, but I've long had a bit of a fascination with Game Freak's pre-Pokemon games, and the few non-Pokemon games that they've since made over the years. <laughs> Magical Taru Ruto-kun is one such game, based on a manga and anime that I know nothing about. There are actually several games based on the character, but only the Mega Drive game is by Game Freak. It's a pretty simple but pleasant little platformer that stands out, since flatter shading like this is not so common on Genesis. I almost beat it on my first run, but I did have to start over just one time, so it's not a total cakewalk, but it's not too intense either. Earlier in 2021, I grabbed a Japanese copy of Treasure's Guardian Heroes because it's way cheaper than the American version. 
but I ended up playing through the Xbox 360 version of this Sega Saturn game on Xbox Series X, because what else do you expect me to do with a cutting edge new gaming system? I also guarantee that I am the only person in the universe who has put a Japanese Guardian Heroes Sega Saturn game disc into an Xbox Series X and listened to the music. Anyway, the game itself is really weird, as expected, but also really neat. Yep, that sounds like a treasure game. And I'd definitely like to take more of the mini routes through the game and see more of the endings, but it probably would take a bit to relearn the rather unusual magical brawler gameplay. Is that it? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Look, Sandy, we did it. Sandy's celebrating over there by killing a sloth. <laughs> <laughs> The last game for a Sega system on my list this year is the Lucky Dime Caper starring Donald Duck for the Game Gear. It's the first of two Game Gear and Master System Donald Duck games and it's simple but enjoyable. The Lucky Dime Caper was actually one of the games I beat on my mister during a 12 hour marathon stream that we put on in September to raise funds so that our friend Joey Versosa could set up his video game art history class with mister equipment, which was very successful by the way, thanks to our community's enthusiasm for the cause. But during that stream, I kept gravitating toward playing PC Engine games because I was actually really enjoying how the D-pad on 8-Bit Doe's PC Engine style controller was feeling. Unlike their Super Nintendo controllers, I actually like this one a bit better than my official NEC controllers. I'd started Valus 2 about two years ago on PC Engine, but never went back to finish it. So I restarted on Mister during the stream and got all the way through. In the name of Roglis and his honor, I shall do battle with you. It won't do to die here. While it was the last of the PC Engine Valus games for me to finish, it's by far the easiest. Laughably easy for maybe the first half, but it does get pretty tough later on. It wasn't the best of the bunch either, but I'll admit I welcomed the much easier final boss battle. Those took me quite a few tries in the other Valus games. <laughs> As you no doubt recall, we celebrated the Year of the Caveman in 2020, but the Caveman cannot be contained by 2020 alone. No, the Caveman always looks to the future, and thus he also conquered 2021. Well, a little bit maybe. I did beat Bonk 3, or more specifically PC Genjin 3 during the Mr. Marathon. And that was fun, although I'm pretty sure Bonk 2 is still the best. So those were all of the games that I beat during the marathon, but I also played the PC Engine's Legendary Axe 2 on Mr. in 2021, whose protagonist probably isn't a caveman, but he sure doesn't seem to like wearing clothes very much. This is a much less popular game than the first Legendary Axe, and deservedly so. Legendary Axe 1 is a masterclass in methodical action platforming after all. But still, Legendary Axe 2 is a fairly decent enough game itself, and I enjoyed my time playing through it, even though the mechanics seem to somehow fall apart when attacking the final boss. Let's see what oh, you've got. Flashing. Oh, he's flashing. I'm, oh, I'm dead. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's about how that goes. Takahashi Meijin no Shin Bokenjima, known as New Adventure Island in the West, is the PC Engine slash Turbo Graphics entry in the Adventure Island series. And of course, we lovingly consider Master Higgins to also be a caveman of a sort. And this one I played earlier in the year on my real PC Engine. I had heard that many people consider this to be their favorite Adventure Island game, and it is a good pick. As with Super Adventure Island, it's definitely a lot less stressful than the NES games, but it's also simpler, being much shorter and lacking both an inventory system and dinosaur buddies. But it is a really fun and challenging little romp with maybe my favorite art in the series, so I highly recommend it.
2021 was a curious year for me. I had a lot of things going on when it comes to both work and family, but I also continued to deck out my game room slash studio space here in the basement, maybe to an obsessive degree. I know what you're thinking, and I assure you, an updated studio tour video is coming. But other than that, it just seemed like I didn't play nearly as many games this year for fun as I had previously. Our Sunday night live streams continue to be a highlight of every week. I can't stress enough that seeing regular faces in the chat makes it a perfect send off for the week and getting ready for the next. They're also good for getting in that extra game time. And suffice it to say, frequent viewers of those streams are gonna see a lot of familiar games in this episode. Everyone knew it was coming after the release of Banana Blitz HD, but Super Monkey Ball Banana Mania arrived sooner than I expected. This remake slash update of the first two Super Monkey Ball games, you know, the best ones, was developed by Ryu Ga Gotaku Studio. RGG was previously known as Amusement Vision, who made the original games, so that's appropriate. Aesthetically, the updates and additions in this remake are welcome, but some of the creative choices, such as the new music, and especially the voices, can be a bit suspect at times. Revisiting the levels from both games, though, it's even more obvious to me now just how obnoxious and gimmicky the level designs in the second game were. But I'm not a monkey ball master or anything, and this felt much tougher to play than the originals. Some levels took me so much longer than they should, and only when I threw any sort of caution to the wind would I succeed. Hurry up! Ten, nine, eight, seven, go! GameSack has a great video that breaks down the analog stick sensitivity nuances between this new version and the originals. Check that out if you want them deets. And when it finally went up, like, it, it said like, it was like, it was like, it sounded like Korean version or, or something like that. <laughs> you did it! You did it! I can't believe it! Clear time! Is that one hour? When Ghosts and Goblins Resurrection was revealed during last year's Game Awards, I was a big defender of the, uh, for lack of a better way to describe it, mural art of the Dark Ages style it was sporting. It just seemed to fit the Sears extraordinarily well, and with glimpses of what looked like remade levels from Ghouls and Ghosts, I was really interested. The G&G series has its fans, but the people who hate it, really hate it. I have to hand it to Capcom. They've given series creator Takuro Fujiwara plenty of chances to bring it back into relevance, and it never seems to fully work out. If this ends up being the final attempt, I think that's okay. I thought that it was honestly a great note to go out on, walking a tightrope between playing homage to the first two games in the series, while also making concessions to make it more accessible to new fans, who might need some help with the series' legendary difficulty. Who knows, maybe it alienated both factions, because it never seemed to move the needle either way. But I thought it was pretty awesome. I dumped a lot of time into the game, even though it routinely got me riled up and frustrated. After years of wanting to, I finally had a chance to really sink my teeth into a cotton game. Cotton Reboot is the first in a tidal wave of cotton re-releases culminating with a new game. I love the huge redone sprites, and there's something extremely satisfying about seeing those score multipliers filling the screen. <laughs> I came back to it pretty often over the course of several months on both the Switch and the PlayStation 4. It's just a really easy beat, since you have unlimited continues. I wish more developers would adopt the treasure method for shooters, earning an extra continue for every hour of gameplay. I appreciated that the X68000 was also included, but what the heck is up with the scaling options, or lack thereof? 
There's resolution details on the option menu, but you can't do anything with it. Why even tease me with that crap? I did a dedicated video on Wonder Boy, Asha, and Monster World, and my feelings haven't softened in the intervening months. This is a series that I love so much. Lizard Cube's remake of The Dragon's Trap and Game Atelier's successor, Monster Boy and the Cursed Kingdoms, are among the best games of the last few years. So a remake of Monster World 4 should have been an easy win. Yeah, it has plenty of charming aspects. The redone music is faithful to its roots while rocking at the same time, and most of Asha's animations were just the cutest. It's not a bad game, it's just a missed opportunity. Six months later, there hasn't been even a single patch to address glaring spelling and grammar mistakes, frame rate, or other weirdness, which makes me think that Asha was unceremoniously dumped and left. At least the inclusion of the original game helps soften the blow just a touch. It's a pretty great version. My disappointment with Asha was similar to how many of my peers felt about Alex Kidd and Miracle World DX. Leading up to release, things weren't looking good. It doesn't play well. There's a horrible judder when the screen scrolls. Your hitbox is so gigantic that you'll die if an enemy even breathes on you. And it turns out that it's true, all of it. But I really, really liked it in spite of all these issues. I felt that the redone backgrounds and sprites are pitch-perfect evolutions of what came before. But what really surprised me the most is the way that it expands upon the original, with all new levels and music. When you switch to the classic graphics mode, they're accompanied by PSG sound versions of these new compositions, and it surprised the heck out of me. You can tell that the people who made this version really love the original game. It's not for everyone, but for my money, I'd say that this is a much better remake than Asha and Monster World. Then we have Actraiser Renaissance, which lowers slowly from the heavens as if it was some sort of divine artifact during a Nintendo Direct. I don't remember the last time I had this severe of whiplash, from total excitement to what the heck is this? Believe me, the original is a stone cold classic on the Super NES. I played through it several times over the years and it's only gotten better each time. It's briskly paced with an iconic soundtrack and the story has moments of immense sadness that only quintet-developed games seem to get right at the time. This remake, though, I'd be curious to see how things got to where they ended up. Honestly, it's not even the graphics. Yeah, it looks janky, but I'll admit that the pixelated 3D rendered sprites have an endearing quality to them like you're playing a Sega Saturn game or something. Good on them for getting Yuzo Koshiro back to do the music, and he even went so far as composing some great new pieces for the game. The actual sim parts are fine too. It's just the constant freaking tower defense parts that ruins it. I hate, hate, hate tower defense games. But if they're a sub-segment in a larger game, then I'm willing to stomach it as long as they're few and far between. Actraiser Renaissance slingshots so far in the other direction that these somehow become the prominent game flavor. I was absolutely incredulous when I played this for the first time during one of our Sunday live streams. Oh God, are you kidding me right now? Are you kidding me? Is there an, is there an, before you still aren't, there's been, there's, there's been like six of these things. If you could simply turn off the tower defense segments, I consider this a pretty solid, but quite inferior to the original remake. Although it's not a series that's been stuck in a long hiatus, it's always exciting to see a new mainline Resident Evil game released. Resident Evil Village picked up the plot threads of 2017's Resident Evil 7, putting us behind the face of Ethan Winters, 
a guy that takes so much abuse that you just can't help but laugh about it. It's been a while since I was excited to play a Resident Evil game on day one. I think the last being Resident Evil 6, and that was just because the, a local game store was selling it several days before the street date. Village breaks up the world in a way where each area feels like it's inspired by a different kind of survival horror game. The opening area in the much publicized castle felt similar to the first and fourth Resident Evil, while the second area takes clear inspiration from the PT or Silent Hills demo famously released a few years back. These are easily the strongest and most interesting parts of the game, and the rest, well, they fail to make a lasting impression on me. Yeah, there were some creepy moments. <laughs> But I guess after the Resident Evil 2 remake, and to a lesser degree Resident Evil 3, arguably perfected the Resident Evil style, I felt disappointed to be back in a first person view. Well then, feel free to peruse. Now, I've heard that it wasn't originally planned to be a mainline Resident Evil game which is maybe why they've been so wishy-washy on the naming of the game. And that makes so much sense. I could have accepted this as a Revelations type side game, but coming off of 7, it felt like a bad decision to make this, technically, Resident Evil 8. Listen, I will never refer to Resident Evil 8 as Resident Evil Village, except for just that. But I mean, look, the V-I-I-I, -I -I, it's right there in the box. But anyway, look, it's not like I dislike Resident Evil 8, but I do feel like Corey and I were just about the only ones kind of disappointed by it. Take it, take it. The first thing that really threw me was that none of the characters actually have European accents. No, they speak English with American accents in rural Europe. Have you seen any other survivors? No. They're all in Louise's house. And she's not answering and the gate is locked. Quiet girl. He's an outsider. It kind of really took me out of the experience and I had a hard time getting over it. Honestly, I've been totally fine with Resident Evil's hard swings between survival horror and more action-oriented games over the years, but Resident Evil 8 tries to blend elements of 7 with the action of 4, and as a result it feels diluted, being neither as creepy as 7 or as freaking awesome as 4. What makes the scariest Resident Evil games great are that you have a limited inventory and have to decide what you bring with you before finally unlocking an ominous emblem door or having to run back through a corridor that you know you've left crawling with bad stuff. RE8 doesn't really have those considerations, so it loses much of what made the other recent entries like RE7 and RE2 remakes so compelling to me. I also thought that the village itself was quite a chore to explore. It never opened up in the way I expected it to, and it never impressed upon me in a way where I learned how to get around by sight and memory. The map makes it look pretty open, but there's stuff like tractors and wagons blocking so many paths, and only one of them is ever moved. So I kind of can't help but wonder if the developers originally planned to open up more shortcuts, but had to scrap the idea due to the slower asset streaming on last gen consoles. While there of course weren't a lot of games that I played on PS5 that I couldn't have played on another system, I nonetheless got good use out of the hardware in its first full year. In order to play local three-player co-op in Sackboy A Big Adventure, I regrettably had to plunk down the cash for extra DualSense controllers, but it sure was fun. This might sound surprising coming from a Nintendo maniac like me, but I think I might like this game more than Super Mario 3D World. That game is clearly Sackboy's biggest inspiration, but I guess 3D World just isn't that high up there for me among 3D Mario games. I didn't even finish my replay of it when it came out on the Switch earlier this year. <clears throat> it's 
It's not exactly a native PS5 game, but PlayStation VR title Blood and Truth does have a PS5 patch that allows it to run at a higher internal resolution and a higher frame rate. The thing is, it's very difficult getting you all together. And my offer is for the whole family. Yeah, can we hurry this up, Tone? I've got a date tonight. This is a British crime action drama inspired by ideas from the London Heist PSVR Worlds demo, but fully fleshed out into a proper game. I just bought these lens inserts based on my new glasses prescription from the VR optician, since wearing glasses in VR was definitely a barrier toward feeling like playing, and this seemed like a fun game to break them in with. Obviously, PSVR is based on some pretty dated tech by now, especially on the controller side, but I did play through this with dual move controllers, and it's easily the best implementation of them in VR that I've personally seen. It's far from flawless, but it works well enough for aiming and interacting with the world to feel really fun. While your ability to manually move around is quite limited, the game succeeds in its goal of making you feel like you're living inside an action movie. I'm sure that there are much more robust VR experiences on PC, but that AAA Sony budget definitely shines through here with great voice and motion capture performances. So no screaming. Okie dokie. So I hope it sold well enough because I'd love to see a sequel on Sony's next gen VR system. Shoot it, shoot it! You know, it's kind of sad, but I can't even think off the top of my head if we even have release dates for any further generational exclusives coming to either PlayStation 5 or Xbox Series systems. But there was, of course, one extremely noteworthy exclusive on PlayStation 5 that we both played this year. And boy, oh boy, did we play it. We are massive fans of Insomniac's Ratchet and Clank series. And hey, aren't you proud of me? I didn't say Insomniac this time. But yeah, following the series being super prolific on PlayStation 2 and PlayStation 3, Ratchet and Clank had kind of a weird PS4 generation, with only one game, which is great and all, but it's also sort of a remake of the original and is tied in with a CG movie that no one asked for. Well, here's to hoping that Ratchet and Clank Rift Apart isn't the last completely original full-length game in the series for another generation. But either way, the long wait was worth it. Topping a crack in time on PS3 was always going to be really difficult, but Rift Apart ups the ante with a dimension hopping story that introduces alternate reality versions of Ratchet and Clank, who I genuinely hope become series regulars. Virtually seamless transitions from one environment to another are baked into the game's design and justifies the new generation of hardware, even if the game itself is actually very traditional in design, which is a plus in my book. Each planet has plenty to discover, but steers well clear of open world tropes. And you know, it just always warms my heart to see Ratchet and Clank games still being made and still staying true to their roots. I mean, I often worry about games like this disappearing because AAA is so dominated by M-rated games with more realistic art styles. So then I says, listen, Mort, you Mort and Mort better hide that lemonade before Mort shows up. But the combat in these games is always the star of the show, with every weapon just being so fun to use. And this was ultimately what led me to starting and finishing a full replay on the highest difficulty immediately after being the game the first time. And how often do I do that these days? Basically never. And I loved the experience of playing it twice, which resulted in my first platinum trophy in nearly a generation. A game that good? Yeah, I think I'd have to call that my game of the year for 2021. Yeah! I am feeling a bit responsible for all of this. Perhaps it is because of me that the dimensions are falling apart, that Ratchet and I are lost. Oh, yeah. Well, hey, your communicator's about to get fixed, so that's something. Ah, right. Crack in Time was 12 years ago. That's crazy, right? It's clear to me now just how misguided I was to think that Insomniac didn't know what to do with the series after that. They were just really biding their time waiting for the technology to catch up to their ambitions. And 
what a game. <laughs> Remember when Kazurai said that the PlayStation 2 would be like controlling Toy Story quality graphics? Yeah, well, 20 years on, and we are finally here. I'm not always a fan of swapping main characters in long-running series, but I absolutely adored Rivet, and I'm excited to see her in future entries. The switching between dimensions is technically impressive, but the way that running, gunning, and platforming still feel perfect is proof positive that gameplay is king. And that's what kept me coming back until I got that platinum trophy, something that, just like Try, I hadn't done in ages. Riding high on Rift Apart, I decided to revisit Insomniac's old Xbox One exclusive, Sunset Overdrive. I tinkered with it back when it came out, but it couldn't hold my attention then, so I let it fall to the wayside. Something like six years later, I played through the entire storyline and came away with zero interest in doing anything else. Don't get me wrong, it's a very fun game to play, combining Ratchet & Clank gunplay and interesting open world traversal, but <laughs> dang, the characters and general aesthetic was akin to nails on a chalkboard for me. Did you see that thing blow? That was amazing! Don't you mean we were amazing? We just killed the big robot! Yeah, we were amazing! Near the start of 2021, I for some reason convinced myself that Detroit Become Human seemed like a relaxing way to spend a couple of evenings. The only other Quantic Dream game that I'd ever played to completion was Heavy Rain and it was all right, but ultimately forgettable. I only played it once, if that tells you anything. Well, at the very least, Detroit was a bit better in all regards and is truly stunning looking. While it starts out with some interesting narrative ideas, there's nothing too original here, and that's okay. The abandoned theme park made me realize that the game's best moments were those that emulated the film AI Artificial Intelligence. I really appreciated seeing Lance Henriksen, who's most famous for playing the android Bishop in Aliens, be the most human character in the story. Humans are such a fragile machine. They break down so quickly. All this effort to keep them going. But like Heavy Rain, I have no desire to go back and see how different choices could change the way a scene unfolds. You choose your investigation of the life of another android, you formulate the thing. As you inch closer to the climax, it leads to a predictable, blockbuster action movie finale that honestly left me feeling bored. In fact, I probably derived the most pleasure from a glitch that happened near the end of the game than just about anything else. Rolling over from 2020 was Star Wars Squadrons, an ode to the classic PC spaceship dogfighting sims, X-Wing and TIE Fighter. Now, I've never played those myself, but when I heard that this was a worthy successor to those games, I figured I'd give it a shot. It was really the VR aspect that was the driving force for me to play it. It really just seemed like the ultimate childhood fantasy. And you know, it was pretty all right. <laughs> The VR stuff is super cool, but in much the same way as what happened with Resident Evil to me last year, I opted out on playing with the PSVR about halfway through because it just became too exhausting after a while. Far in the opposite direction is Microsoft Flight Simulator. Late last year, this was the game that I really wanted more than anything else for the Xbox Series X. There's not a lot that I can really say about this other than that it's simply relaxing and fascinating to fly around and take in the graphics and atmosphere. I think that it's really telling just how good this game looks when my son walked into the room and said, wait, is that a plane flying around outside right now? I grew up near the airport in my hometown, Jamestown, New York, so naturally that was the first place that I took off from and flew around over my old neighborhood and surrounding areas reliving memories. Maybe one day I'll take in more of the sim aspects, 
but that was exactly what I wanted out of the game, and it fully delivered. In reality, everything that I played earlier in the year were simple props to occupy my time until February, where I'd finally get to bathe in the glow of the newest entry of one of my absolute favorite game series. It was my most anticipated game going into 2021, Ease 9 Monstrum Knox. Falcom's long-running Ease series is one of the few select that will make me drop everything in order to play it on day one. Ease 9 was no different, especially since 2016's Ease 8 had nestled into the number one spot of my favorite entry in the series. I was super excited to see where Adol and Dogi's travels would take them next, but I'll admit that the initial reveal of Ease 9 had me sweating a little bit. Screenshots made it look like a darker tale with limited scope, since the entire game was supposed to take place in a single town, the prison city of Balduk. You can't fool me. You returned from the cursed Isle of Saren. You were involved with the Atlas Ocean incident. And most recently, you were seen in Altago in the aftermath of the ceasefire. You are being arrested on the grounds of your suspicious involvement in these events. Thankfully, that wasn't the case, as the town was absolutely enormous, and there's plenty of things to discover since it feels a bit open world, but it's focused enough that it doesn't succumb to the tropes I tend to hate about the open world genre. It helps that navigating the town is super fun thanks to the different superhero-esque abilities you acquire along the way, but when it comes down to it, these games live and die by two things, combat and soundtrack and both are just as good as I've come to expect over the 30 plus years of the series' lifetime. Combat was A plus in Ease 8, and this evolves it just enough to make it feel fresh. The soundtrack never quite reaches Sunshine Coastline Heights, but there's some real good stuff here. So, you're the one I've been hearing so much about. Clearly a side effect from the popularity of Falcom's Legend of Heroes series, the storyline in Ease games have become more and more of a focus. Recent entries have been especially wordy, but I was surprised by a story that didn't revolve around Adol having to kill yet another god. Monstrum Nox is a more personal journey with a mystery at its core that kept me guessing all the way through. Sprinkle in some nods to previous games, and you have a game that longtime fans will really appreciate. Huh. Interesting. So this is the adventurer Adol Kristen. I personally don't care for the recent tendency for Adol to have more speaking parts, though. I like him more as a man of few words. Yes! Got one! Still, I put in more than 70 hours by the end, doing pretty much all the side quests and missions, and I've considered doing it all again now that there's a 4K patch when playing on a PS5. That should be a pretty big upgrade since it looked pretty rough in its original incarnation. 8 was a much better looking game. Still, as always, I'm looking forward to Ease 10. I just hope that one day we're able to get the Old Man Adol game. Now that would be awesome. In search of a relaxing weekend game, I randomly popped in Gree, or Grizz, or however you say it, and I was completely hooked till I finished it a few hours later. The watercolor painting style is gorgeous, minimalist and striking. It made me feel things and was exactly the game that I needed to play at that exact time. In late spring, I was on the precipice of some crunch time at my job. In preparation, I was rendering out dozens of graphics that took a couple of hours each. I knew that I was gonna have tons of hurry up and wait downtime. And with my wife and kids gone on vacation for 10 days, it was time to indulge myself in Remedy Studios Control. 
I said it before and I'll say it again. I've been a big fan of Remedy's games since the first Max Payne. And I went into the control experience with nearly zero knowledge of what to expect from the game, outside of what I'd seen in random video clips on Digital Foundry to show off frame rate. I had no knowledge of the story or gameplay. And the ones that see it happen freak out and try to forget what they saw. I'm here. Why did you bring me here? And it freaking blew me away from the opening moments. I was pretty down on Quantum Break, but Control redeemed everything in my eyes. I was enraptured by the sterile, uncomfortable, and alien style of the oldest house and the survivors that inhabited it. The cinematography made it feel like a Denis Villeneuve film with enormous flat structures looming over you at all times. But the ashtray maze was probably the most incredible moment I played in any game all year. More than anything, it was the hook of the Remedy Connected Universe that completed the experience for me. This was previously hinted at in their other games, but key moments confirm that Max Payne, Alan Wake, Quantum Break, and now Control all take place in the same universe. As a longtime fan, this had me embarrassingly giddy. It was a distress call. Phaeton sensed a drowning man, a hunger in the dark. Investigation sector. Investigation sector, huh? Everything gelled together perfectly, creating an experience that was unforgettable to me. I got the Platinum Trophy, and I'm still thinking about it six months later. If you haven't played Control yet, I highly, highly recommend you do so with as little of knowledge as possible and just take it all in. It's an easy pick for my game of the year. Something's coming. This threat. Attack. Duty as director. Keep the Bureau safe. From the surprise announcement during Nintendo's E3 Direct to record breaking sales numbers when it was released in October, the arrival of Metroid Dread, or Metroid 5, if you will, was a long time coming. 20 years. Man, has it really been that long? I think that Metroid Dread is a fantastic game. I love that it retained the 2D perspective, and Samus's redesign was a great way to fix the fusion suit. It's fast-paced, controls tightly, and the 70s sci-fi-inspired music gave it a unique flavor. I really disliked the Emmy sections all the way through, and how it made the game feel unfinished the way that it goes directly to the game over screen when one kills you. But still. I had enough fun to finish it and get 84% item collection. I think back on it after just a couple of months, and all I remember is how it lacked that same sort of excitement for me as previous Metroid games would stir up. I realized then and there that the answer was obvious. And this is no fault of the game, it's just that there's so many, too many games in this genre that I'm just straight up burnt out on them. Even a new game in the series that pretty much spearheaded the genre no longer feels special. And that makes me pretty sad. Metroid Dread seems to have been not only one of the most anticipated games of 2021, but also one of the best received. And like Corey, I honestly wish that I felt so strongly about the game myself. It's certainly well made and Samus feels great to control, but to me what makes a Metroid style game great is the feeling that you get to know the world that you're playing in. 
you start to build a mental map of how it all fits together. And then there's that rush of excitement when you emerge from a door that you'd previously passed through hours earlier, but couldn't reach. Like, oh yeah, this place. But in dread, every time I picked up a new power, I would think, oh, I've seen plenty of stuff like this that I can now destroy, but was soon disappointed when the map revealed that most of those barriers were just shortcuts between rooms I'd recently passed through. And I then soon realized that I was often being funneled toward only one or two obvious next paths to take. So it's clear that the devs wanted to keep the game's momentum going and keep friction against the player at a minimum, but the result was me feeling disengaged from the exploration process. I missed poring over the map and pondering where I might want to check out next because there was already something to do right in front of me at nearly all times. It turned into a relatively mindless romp through this planet, and I remembered almost nothing about where I'd been from one hour to the next. I honestly just don't know what the solution to Metroidvania fatigue is, because I agree that this open, but not open world, structure has long been one of the best ways to build a game world. But when pretty much literally every indie dev feels a burning need to make their own tribute to Super Metroid or Symphony of the Night, it's just not so special anymore, to the point where even Metroid 5 feels like, eh, just another good but forgettable game. So there are like so, so, so many more games that I played this year that I'd love to ramble on and on about at length, but you know, at this time of year, I just don't have time to edit two plus minutes on every game. So I'm gonna have to adopt Corey's strategy from the Nintendo Switch Online Controllers episode and turn the rest of this section into a lightning round. I'll give myself 30 seconds per game. It's not everything, and it's not everything I wish I could say, but here we go. Something I could always use some more of is Ace Attorney. So thank you, thank you, thank you Capcom for finally bringing the great Ace Attorney games to the West in English in the Great Ace Attorney Chronicles. So far I've only played the first part called The Great Ace Attorney Adventures, but I'm sure I'll be playing the included part two before long. Earlier in the year, I streamed Cruisin' on the Wii, which was exactly as bad and hilariously janky as I expected. So with this in mind, I greatly anticipated Cruisin' Blast on the Switch and I didn't even much care whether it was good or not. Turns out, it's actually good. I mean, there's not exactly much mechanical nuance to it, but it is fun, it's silly, you can drift and flip through the air as a triceratops or an attack helicopter, what more do you want? I actually beat Blaster Master Zero on the backloggery New Year's Eve stream, so it didn't make it into 2020's video, but I did play through Blaster Master Zero 2 a few months later. I liked both, but I did appreciate that Zero 2 wasn't so much a remake of the first game and went to some new places. Both good games though, and I look forward to getting my limited run games copy of the third one. I already mentioned that I didn't quite finish replaying Super Mario 3D World on Switch, but I did play Bowser's Fury all the way to 100%. Now that was a great game and exactly the kind of open world that I can get behind. It's basically like if individual levels from Super Mario 64 existed within one seamless world. I think there's a fan hack for that actually. But Bowser's Fury is a great bite-sized 3D platformer, and I can't wait to see what it means for the next full-on Super Mario game. Drum and Lynn and I got back to our playthrough of Diablo 3 that we started like two or three years ago or something. So we spent a few long Saturdays playing it this past fall and we're close to finishing, but I thought I'd just go ahead and put it on this year's video instead of saving it for 2022 when we'll surely soon finish it. It's been a good experience actually playing a Diablo game, but to be honest, I don't necessarily think I'll need any more Diablo in my life after this. Corey played a bit of Kaze and the Wild Masks on the back half of the stream in November. It may look like Klonoa, but we were surprised to discover that it actually plays extremely similarly to Donkey Kong Country. So of course I immediately bought it. You've got roll jumps, ponytail propeller spins, and many levels straight up use DKC1 and DKC2 level gimmicks. 
So it's hardly the most original game, but it is much more to my personal liking than the Retro Studios DKC games. I just have to squeeze in a nod to Panzer Paladin by Tribute Games. This combines elements of Mega Man, Zelda 2, Blaster Master, and more of the NES's best games into one heck of a retro love letter that really stands out. In fact, this is one of the absolute top pixel art indie games I've ever played, perhaps the best since Shovel Knight. It's basically like a late generation NES game on overdrive and should not be missed by any retro action side scroller fans. An NES game that Panzer Paladin did not take inspiration from was Legacy of the Wizard. I'd been drawn toward this game by its charming main character sprites, Yuzo Koshiro soundtrack, and the promise of adventure in its expansive underground ruins. But it is the most obtuse NES game I have ever played, and the controls for how you push blocks with some characters is just beyond my capacity to describe. It's kind of a bad game, but I just can't hate it. Exactly 30 years after its release, I finally beat Final Fantasy Adventure on Game Boy. Although on the Nintendo Switch and M2's collection of mana, since the battery in my cart should probably be replaced. I liked it a lot actually for about the first half or so, but eventually the dungeons became quite a slog the larger they got, without much rhyme or reason to their design. So I did start to follow a guide later on, but still an overall good game with some top tier Game Boy music. Perhaps the surest measure of my feelings toward Bravely Default 2 is that every time I sort my Switch library by total playtime, I now feel nothing but shame and regret that it is ahead of Breath of the Wild. I'm always up for Final Fantasy V style job system shenanigans, but the game's content just doesn't justify it being so drawn out. Super Nintendo and PS1 RPGs generally have so much more stuff happen over far fewer hours. One game that I do feel such a need to discuss more in depth than I have the time for here is Octopath Traveler. I think the key to appreciating this game is to look at it more as a western style RPG disguised as a Japanese RPG. It's actually rather unusual, and I really respect what the dev team did here, in spite of a mixed execution. But it's a bit of a sore topic right now, because I wasted most of a recent Sunday afternoon tackling the big post-game boss to no avail. <sighs> Moving on. As you're probably sick of hearing, Final Fantasy XIV's story gets super duper great, especially in the expansions, and I finally played through the third expansion, Shadowbringers, in 2021. And right now I'm waiting for the Endwalker rush to die down a bit before I jump into that one. Oh, and I did a freelance episode for Digital Foundry back in June going over FF14's history and performance on consoles, from the Xbox 360 tech demo on up to the PlayStation 5, so please check that out. So I have collected at least some version of every physically released Kirby game, so I was obligated to play, and by some description, beat Kirby Air Ride. So I had been working off and on to open the complete 100 challenges square on the challenge grid for years, which unlocks credits. Some people were just the right age with just the right group of friends to fall in love with this game back in the day, but driving in this game is just no fun at all. Corey mentioned Super Monkey Ball Banana Mania. Well, I played Super Monkey Ball Banana Blitz HD, the port of the Wii game, now freed from its gyro-controlled prison. I did beat this years and years ago on the Wii, somehow, but now that I can play it with an analog stick, I can definitely confirm that the level design is much more fun than Super Monkey Ball 2. And I do believe there is definitely something off with Banana Mania's controls, because Banana Blitz HD does feel way better in comparison. While Mercury Steam's Metroid Dread received near-universal acclaim, it was not so with their work on Castlevania. Still, I thought Lords of Shadow was an interesting and visually striking game for its time, but I never played Lords of Shadow 2 until this past year. It's very much an action game of its time and is definitely not amazing, but I do like the idea of this modern setting where the history of Dracula's reign of terror is considered indisputed historical fact. 
I don't often stream PC games, but I was very excited to play through Chex Quest after getting my big box from Limited Run Games. This famous serial licensed kid friendly game from the 90s running on the Doom engine was definitely something I played a bit of as a young teenager, but never finished back in the day. And it is legitimately one of the most actual good and most silly relics of 90s marketing. Now something Doom related that is actually Doom that I played in 2021 is Night Dive Studios port of Doom 64 which for those unaware has totally different levels from the original PC Doom. I'd never played much of it on N64, so it was a real treat in HD on the Switch. I actually didn't play much Doom in general back in the day, but I've really come to appreciate this era of first person shooter. Looking up and down is so overrated. Who needs that when the classics feel this good? With Fire Emblem Echoes Shadows of Valentia, it was kind of refreshing to play a new to me Fire Emblem without all the daggum baby making. It's actually a really nice looking game for the hardware and the gameplay is excellent as always, although only one on hand item per character did take some getting used to. And you know, I'm hardly an advocate for all games needing voices, I mean quite the opposite actually, but the fully voiced story in this is very impressive for 3DS. You might be wondering about the lack of classic games on my list of stuff that I played this year. Believe me, I've thought about it a lot too. And I only realized how lacking it was once I started gathering games for this episode. Thing is, I skewed heavily towards newer games this year because of the happenings in the classic game scene, with insane prices of older games and hardware. Whether it be due to the pandemic or ridiculous WADA ratings, it all put a damper on my enthusiasm for a portion of the year, and it wasn't until the analog pocket that I really started to get at some of it back. And that was because I realized that my portable game collection was severely lacking. Mega Man 7 and 8 are the last two mainline Mega Man games I never finished, so I decided to take on 8 earlier in the year. And it was a mostly great experience. It seems like most people only ever remember the hilariously awful English voice acting, but I appreciated the attempt to further the traditional Mega Man formula without going too overboard. It's only when going too far outside the box that things really suffer. Of course, I'm talking about the jump jump, slide slide hoverboard parts, which become absolutely stressful and infuriating after a number of attempts. Jump, 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 jump. Sunsoft's Journey to Silius was the lone NES game that I played significantly this year, and I wasn't able to beat it. Everyone loves to talk about the music because Sunsoft was at the top of their game during this period, but Silius is a really solid running gun that lives up to its reputation. It's just tough as nails. Well, actually, I guess it's not really that hard. I just ran into one specific problem area that absolutely wrecked me and siphoned all of my lives and continues without remorse. Dollars are thirty, thirty-five dollars, um, I think. I don't understand. I don't understand. It's like it's not like anything. It's just I don't understand. <laughs> See, like right there, like I was literally. <laughs> I've played Eric Chahi's Another World countless times since I first bought it on the Super NES, but I wanted to mention it in this video because every time I revisit it, this time on the Nintendo Switch, I'm reminded just how much of a treasure it is. I initially wanted to try it out with the Nintendo Switch Online controllers and ended up playing through the whole darn thing. This is absolutely one of the best games of all time. A 
late addition to my list is the recently released localization of Bulk Slash for the Sega Saturn. Bulk Slash is one of those super expensive Japanese games that really shows off what the system can do. I use the word localization because this is much, much more involved than a fan translation. Leone Rhodes, Sergeant First Class Reporting. I'm here to help, Chris. The team recorded all new voiceovers and straight up added in support for the Saturn's virtual on twin sticks. It's madness not to play this if you have the means to. I absolutely adore how the translation and voice acting feel of the era. It sounds like something that would have been in a working designs game or something in 1997. Sergeant Colon Steiner reporting in. My navigation is kind of amazing. Also, how freaking good is the music when you're about to finish a level? It's been a while since I've heard some game music this hype inducing. A huge congratulations to the development team, and I can't wait to see what you take on next. Shield recovery. Of course, all the regular viewers of our Sunday night live streams are expecting Alligator Hunt from Galco. This arcade exclusive gallery shooter, think uh, Wild Guns, blew my face clean off when I discovered it during the Evercade VS stream. I mean, just look at this main character. He's just a kid on a skateboard. And then he jumps in a spaceship, and that's where he spends the rest of the game. And this theme music. It's all one long composition like the Space Harrier music. You know, the Galco Evercade cart has some other gems on it too. Check out World Rally. Fans of Neo Drift Out on the Neo Geo will think that this game ripped it off, but it's actually the other way around. I finally got my hands on Weststone's Once Thought Lost arcade game, Clockwork Aquario. The story behind this game is really interesting with roots going back to the early 90s. I guess it's your typical arcade game of the era, with some huge, gorgeous sprites. The soundtrack by Shinichi Sakamoto relentlessly assaults your ears with summery synth beats. Sure, it's over pretty quick, but it's an arcade game. What do you want, a 40 hour long platformer with limited continues? Rolling Gunner plus Overpower is my kind of shooter. I brought the Switch version on vacation for a long weekend and ended up dumping a ton of time into it between hiking with my family. I'm not sure what the development team before this, but for me, it harkened back to the horizontally scrolling cave shooter, Akai Katana, although it was much easier to wrap my head around the scoring system here. The main Rolling Gunner mode is a solid bullet hell with some simple controls, but I spent most of my time in the Overpower mode where you can use the right analog stick to aim your satellite. Our type is a shooter series whose difficulty scares me more than Gradius. But when R-Type Final 2 was crowdfunded a couple years back, I was grateful to see the series being resurrected. Although I didn't participate in the Kickstarter, I grabbed the PS4 version when it was released during the spring. Yeah, of course it's tough as nails but it's always cool to see the Unreal Engine powering a game genre you don't normally expect it to. Final 2 is a really good looking game, at least most of the time. A deluge of updates and remade classic levels continues to show that this is made for the longtime fans of the series. There were also a couple of really, really amazing retro style game throwbacks that made a super strong impression on me this year. First, we have Tanuki Justice from Agalos developer Wonderboy Bobby. This run and gun is completely relentless and is so hardcore that if you want to submit a high score to the leaderboards, you can't pause the game even once. 
Wonder Boy Bobby continues their uncanny ability to make a game look like it was running on a Sega Master System. Something about the use of specific colors that make it seem authentic. The winning run through the final level during our Sunday livestream is one of my proudest gaming achievements of the year. Did I do it? I'm guessing there's nothing after it. The other game was Steel Assault. Don't let the ultra generic name fool you. This is an extremely well made run and uh, a whip, I guess. This was kickstarted a while back and I had no idea that it even existed until a Tribute dropped a download code in our email box. As such, I was completely blindsided by just how good it is. A number of different elements come together to make it great. But for me, it was the zipline mechanic in particular that gave me those old Bionic Commando vibes. Joseph Cuesta Bailey brings the whole thing home with one of the best soundtracks I've heard in forever. And it even includes a FM synth remix of said soundtrack. After last year's great success with my kids in Pokemon Snap, I joked that I hoped that my kids were still in the Pokemon when new Pokemon Snap came out. Although I wouldn't admit it, I knew there was going to be a 100% chance that they'd already have moved on. I got the game anyway, even though I knew the outcome. It's good. We played a ton the first day and then never again until I had to capture some gameplay for this video that you're watching right now. I didn't finish it, but I feel compelled to mention 2021's favorite whipping boy, Yuji Naka, and the debacle that was Balan Wonderworld. I don't know. I just don't think it's all that bad if you just take it for what it is a weird, outside-of-the-box kind of game that so commits to being a one-button game that it's kind of ambitious in its simplicity. It's a hard sell, but he did it anyways, and it backfired and was a gigantic bomb. But, you know, at least Naka and his team made the game that they wanted to make. <laughs> I was a big fan of Titanfall 2 a couple of years back, so of course I was interested in Respawn's Star Wars Jedi Fallen Order. I held out for a next-gen upgrade and settled on the PS5 version. Again, we have a very competently made game, full of stuff I like, and I finished the game. Although, I did knock the difficulty down the story mode so I could just have a good time being an unstoppable Jedi. But, you know, like the Metroidvania formula, I think... I just need to take a prolonged break from Star Wars. Fact is, I'm tired and bored of it, and I think I've been heading that way since immediately after Episode 1 came out in 1999. The realization cropped up when I was playing Squadrons, but Fallen Order confirmed it. I mean, this is the best realization I've seen of using a lightsaber in any game I've ever played. And I still couldn't get into it. That's not the fault of the game. That is all me. I actually had no idea that Corey had just played through Jedi Fallen Order when I bought the PS5 version myself and decided that, hey, I was just going to play it straight away too. And I actually definitely got more into it than he did. I thought Fallen Order felt kind of anachronistic in a good way, like a game from another time. As if it were a remake of an ambitious 2007 game released on PS2, Xbox, or GameCube, but was ignored and poorly reviewed because it had radical gameplay ideas and wasn't on the latest consoles. 
the kind of game that would have had a small but passionate cult trying to get the word out that, hey, Jedi Fallen Order was actually really good and it did Demon Souls before Demon Souls. And then when it was remade in 2019, it finally got the attention it deserved. Obviously, none of that is true. Jedi Fallen Order was a brand new game in 2019 and is a good but derivative game that borrows some Souls-like concepts but feels more, well, as I say, like a GameCube game or something. It's even got a really Metroid Prime-like map screen and the paths and platforms broadly feel like levels that could have existed in a game from a decade and a half ago, but with additional geometry added for this theoretical remake. I guess I just say all this to say, I just felt really warm and happy knowing that this old-fashioned single-player 3D action adventure was, in fact, a relatively brand new video game published by the last company you'd expect to release such a game. Combined with the fact that it was well-received, it just gives me hope, I guess. I didn't think it was spectacular or anything, but it was just a comfy sort of game that plays pretty well and it kind of made me feel like a Star Wars fan again. One of the most notable gaming stories of 2021, at least from our perspective, was the almost closure of the PlayStation Store on PlayStation 3 and PlayStation Vita. Luckily, that decision was reversed, but the initial panic did spur me to quickly buy up a bunch of physical PS3 and PSP games for fear of the prices shooting up. And in spite of all that, I actually didn't beat any PS3 or PSP games this year. I did play a good ways into Infamous 2, but I mean, I like it well enough, but you know, open world games and all that. Still haven't finished it. But I did beat a small handful of PS1 and PS2 games. My lightning round may be officially over, but Let's run through these with the same momentum. Parasite Eve was the Game Club Game of the Month for May over on the My Life and Gaming Supporter Discord, and I decided that I was actually going to do it this time. Although, I didn't actually beat it until October, even though it's a pretty short game. It has cool equipment customization and a real bad translation. And it was actually the first game I played entirely from start to finish with the PS1 Digital HDMI mod, the X-Station ODE, and the Mem Card Pro, and it all worked beautifully. Resident Evil 8 wasn't the only creepy village game I played in 2021, and Fatal Frame 2 is the way better game, no contest. It's even better than Fatal Frame 1, although it's hard to put my finger on any one reason why. In general, I tend to find ghosts much scarier than physical monsters, and the Fatal Frame series horror just works so well for me. In fact, if I had to pick my favorite new-to-me game of 2021, it would very likely be Fatal Frame 2. Ape Escape 3 is definitely more ambitious than Ape Escape 2, but it still doesn't have that whoa, nothing else I've ever played is quite like this feeling that the first Ape Escape gave me in 2019. However, it's got fun movie genre themed levels, an incredible art style that unfortunately pushes the PS2 just a little too hard, and new character transformation skills, all of which help make up for Ape Escape 2's relative lack of new ideas but the whole thing really is an excellent 3D platforming trilogy all around. In the summer of 2021, we decided to make time for something that neither of us do pretty much ever these days, online co-op. We played through Hazelight Studios' first co-op required game, A Way Out, in 2018 when I was visiting Corey, but a lot of people seem to not realize that we actually live about eight hours apart, so you'd think we'd play online more often. But we knew that Hazelight's latest game, which also requires two players, was going to be something that we just couldn't miss. Hey, my body feels weird. Because you're made of clay? Having seen absolutely nothing about It Takes Two following its reveal at the 2020 Game Awards, the first thing that surprised me when we started was, oh wow, this is a 3D platformer. 
Seriously, I had no idea what type of game we were even in for this time, and I was immediately impressed by just how fun the character animations are and how fluid and natural running and jumping feels. I had a smile on my face from the first minute of playing, and that feeling of joy never went away for this entire whimsical experience that is just constantly throwing fresh, funny, and beautifully designed environments and scenarios at you. Whoa! Whoa, ice orbs, May! I have cool magician powers! And I have fire! Wow! One thing that I appreciate is that while you often gain new abilities, they aren't permanently added to your repertoire. Wow. Cool. <laughs> we got a flying nail and a talking hammer. <laughs> Let's go. So throughout the game, you'll pick up new tools that complement a different tool used by the other character. And the game fully explores the gameplay possibilities of each gimmick within the space of an hour or so, and then ditches it for something new and completely different. So this way, nothing gets old and the controls never become overcomplicated at any point. It Takes Two did, of course, win the Game of the Year award at the Game Awards, and in the moment of playing it, I felt like it was my Game of the Year too. I think both of us did. And I know I said earlier that Ratchet and Clank was my Game of the Year, but you know what? I ain't handing out trophies. Who the heck says that I can't have two Games of the Year? So I'm just gonna say it. Ratchet and Clank, Rift Apart, and It Takes Two. Two games tied for my Game of the Year 2021. Oh no! We got to fight him on there. We got to fight him. It's like. Time to say goodbye. <laughs> <laughs> to smash your wooden face. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and I get to fly. <laughs> oh my god! It's like it's got our life bars. It's yeah. like, and the controls are like totally like Street Fighter. <laughs> oh, he's like got some special moves too. Try did a really great job summing up what makes It Takes Two so amazing gameplay-wise. But for me, as someone who's been married for 13 years and has two younger kids, I connected with the story as a husband and a father in a way that I never expected to. I found myself comparing May and Cody's experience to myself and my wife's. Not that we've ever been turned into a little wooden doll or anything like that or been counseled by a talking book, but just reminiscing about our lives together and the moments we had as we fell in love, got married, and had children. Then I put my own kids in Rose's shoes and imagined what they were seeing as their parents were in survival mode while COVID raged, filled with emotional peaks and valleys. Cody, it's time to awaken Basha! Ah, uh, yeah! Oh, oh, yeah! Oh. Feelings are complex, and I appreciate how the story didn't present any easy answers. It's been a hard couple of years for everyone, and I think It Takes Two arrived precisely at the time when it was needed the most. I wonder how many people were helped by the experience of this game. I know I was, and that's why it's also my second game of the year. The biggest question I have now is, how the heck can Hazelight Studios possibly top this? Between It Takes Two and A Way Out, They've paid homage to so many genres and created so many unforgettable moments that I don't envy having the challenge of following it up. But I'll be there regardless of what they do. Okay, that'll do it for 2021. As always, we want to extend a heartfelt thank you to both new and longtime viewers of our little show. Let's do our best to work towards a better tomorrow, and we will continue to provide entertainment in the best way that we can in 2022.